All right, so that was it for the recap. Uh, there's a few key moments there, but uh, it was kind of interesting to see the Kibler. I think the emphasis on Kibler's performance, like we saw a slightly marginal play with the you know non fell Reaver and the Flame Tongue Totem. So he's a really solid player overall, and he's doing probably the best as an individual as than anyone else in the league so far. He's far ahead of anyone else for the Master of Duels title, uh, which is basically going to be awarded to the player who's got the best individual score. And he's going to get, uh, you know, $5,000 bonus on top of possible game winnings. So let's go over the, um, the format of the entire event. Uh, I mean, it's a team conquest format. You have teams of three players. Uh, you have six decks per team, so each team will be bringing two decks per player. They'll be allocated preemptively, so you can't just switch in the middle of it. You'll have one class, obviously, per... I mean, one deck per class, and you have to blind pick. So you don't know what your opponent is going to queue into you next. So you have to try to me make the best educated guess as to what you're going to be queuing into, maybe trying to get your best matchups and whatnot. And the goal is to win with all of your decks. Once you've done that, you win the entire series. And in the case of a player losing two matches in a row, he's going to be benched, which means he can't play again until one of his teammates grabs a win from their opponents. So it's a little bit of a tricky format, I think. Um, I mean, Shaki, you've been playing to this quite a bit. Uh, how does it feel like conquest-wise? Do you have any strategy or do you just kind of throw decks in there and hope they're going to stick? Uh, we kind of have strategy. I feel like everything, every team's kind of the same on this page. It's like, there's sort of strategy, but at the end of the day, it's conquest. You're kind of just thrown out. Like you said, it's blind pick. You just kind of hope. And some weeks you get the best of that. Recently, we really haven't gotten the best of that, so you feel kind of yeah, like really unlucky when you literally just get the worst matchups possible. And so, I mean, there's a little bit of luck to it, maybe some strategy to it. But the fact yeah. that it's a best of 11 kind of helps balance all that out. Yeah, yeah the, the sheer amount of games. Go ahead, Monk. Yeah, I was just saying, going back to the, the Master of Duels thing with right. Kibler having an 8-0 lead pretty much over everyone else, I think that doesn't paint a very clear picture in the sense that it's very easy for Kibler to just crash and burn in any given week. I know coming from Liquid's losses, in one week we had everyone doing well, but Savitz went 0-5. And, and another week we had everyone doing well, but um, Sho went 0-6. So it's certainly possible for just one player to get a really, just have a really bad week. And it just speaks to the format of this league. So Kibler definitely, uh, he's in the lead, but he definitely hasn't clinched it yet. Yeah, that yeah. sounds very uh, optimistic. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I could see that. Go ahead. Things can change really fast. I mean, the one week we had, like, five 4-0 players, and I think everyone but Kibler all lost. Like, Life Coach lost three times, and he doesn't really even need to crash and burn necessarily. Like, just going 2-2 two and two, uh, isn't really that great if you really are fighting for the highest win percentage overall. Like, 50%, nobody's going to tell you that's, like, bad, but it's very likely someone else does better. Uh, and, I mean, we saw kind of like in the standings, Hyped and Firebat are kind of on his tail. They only have three losses. So, for instance, if Kibler went like 2-3 and three and one of those players went 2-0, and oh, suddenly it's just tied up. Yeah, I like that point because it's very easy to accumulate in a conquest format. You know, a huge amount of losses. You mentioned five or six. That's just it's, it, just one bad week, as you say, could just ruin Kibler's record where he might end up, you know, 8-5. We don't wish that for him, but, you know, it might just happen. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I hope uh, I hope we'll see some more of that shaman. Is all I'm asking for. It's one of those classes that at the beginning of the league wasn't very popular, and then somehow it picked up like massively in popularity. Uh, what do you think about it? Like, for, do you think it's a class that you expect people to bring this week again, or did things settle down a bit? Uh, there's kind of like this new mech shaman list, and I don't think it was actually the one Kibler was playing. It's kind of been developed like in the last two weeks, and I guess. Okay. I guess it was Team Archon that kind of developed it, and it's it's much faster. It plays Leroy Jenkins. A lot of people are kind of hopping on that, and it's done really well in open tournaments, so I'd expect to see that deck a little more. Uh, I'm not sure if it'll fit into every lineup because it is still, you know, it's not top three, probably not top four, but it's it's fighting for that spot of fifth slash sixth deck. And right. if, well, if we'll teams see. value it, we'll see, yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah, uh, I, it's always I, a toss-up. I believe that list uh, actually originates from Korea, and what happened was like uh, some NA players like Boxception and Nostum got a hold of the list, and from there um, everyone be it, began playing it in North American open tournaments. And you can kind of see it on the North American ladder, and from there Firebat got that list and uh, played it, around with uh, it in a few tournaments. Fire. And he and then six then um, Zelay played around with that as well. And not only that, I believe Sixo played in it. Um, 
played with it yeah. quite a lot in the um, OG. He and, played it in uh, OG, and yep, exactly. And yeah, possible, he did quite well in that. Yeah, yeah I mean, speaking of six though, he's been doing pretty well lately, right? Yeah. And guess yeah. what? We have a we have a player intro for six zero. Let's check that out. That's crazy. Smooth. Yeah, I'm Sixer, playing for Team Archon and been mostly known for playing open tournaments and generally everything that's open to everyone, so open tournaments and ladder. Yeah, Twitch chat thinks I only play face decks, so I guess that's what I'm most known for. There have been formats like that in the very early phases of Hearthstone, which were a lot of, lots of fun, so I'm really glad that formats like that come back and I think my team is probably the favorite to win the tournament. Yeah, thanks for watching. I hope I get to play lots of games. No, actually, no, it's Conquest. I hope I only get to play two games every week. But yeah, thanks for watching. Well, to keep on uh, going with the smoothness, I guess we'll, uh, you know, mention that Team Archon, the team of which you enumerated all the players prior to the, the spotlight, is going to be playing against Value Town shortly. It's a team that, I mean, both teams have been doing fairly okay. I think they have uh, a similar result. At Value Town is 3-1, to one, where Team Archon is 2-2. Two, two. But all it takes here is for Value Town to lose, and they're going to be equal in score, uh, at least as far as the total wins and losses for series. So let's take a look at the lineup. Anything stands out as unusual? Um, Firebat playing Warrior is extremely unusual. I know Firebat, he doesn't really like Control Warrior, and Zelay and Sixo seem to be like the standard like Patron Warrior players that everyone knows and loves. Like pretty much within the Hearthstone scene, you have like five or six players that really, really like are dedicated to Patron play. And I would consider Sixo and Zelay two of them, but not necessarily Firebat. Oh, Ooh. well. <laughs> Okay. Uh -huh. yeah. There was a. We were okay. baited out. You know what, Monk? Your <laughs> observation skills are through the roof. This is amazing. Wow. Well, amazing pickup. There goes <laughs> that analysis. Yeah. Anything else uh, from your side, Shocky? Uh, yeah. So Kibler switched from Shaman to Druid. That's kind of been his go to classes. Uh, he did play Druid one week, and I believe it was actually the week they lost, but of course, he did win both of his matches, so it went fine. Uh, but the team dropped the match, and I think that was like, of all the weeks, that was the one that Value Town learned a lot from uh, when they lost to my team, Force and Boys, because not only did they bring kind of a weaker deck in the, the Paladin deck, but they didn't bring Freeze Mage. They kind of psyched themselves out. And from what I've learned from like talking to a bunch of people about this league format is that the more games you add, the better Freeze Mage really gets because it only has so many bad matchups like against Warrior, and you're right. so much less likely to queue it. Whereas as you add these lower tier decks, Shaman, Priest, Paladin, all of them are bad against Freeze Mage. And that's like a common trend of the bad decks. So Freeze Mage really preys on a lot of decks, and it's almost guaranteed to get a win. And so I think almost every single team brings Freeze Mage, and the weeks that they haven't haven't really worked out. Yeah, I think that's a really, really great point. The point about Freeze Mage is that, like, how many decks really hard counter it? I guess you could say Druid's a decent matchup against it. Mm -hmm. uh, and you've got probably the Patron and Control Warrior, which, uh, I mean, we haven't seen any Control Warrior really in tournament play. It's decent on ladder. Even then, it's phasing out because of the addition of too many weapon hate, uh, too much weapon hate, I guess, and uh, a lot of techs for people. So I guess the only difference here again is that sixth class. We expect Mage, Rogue, Hunter, Warlock, Warrior, and then you have a sixth spot that you kind of have to fill, and in this case, Value Town went with Druid, where Team Icon picked Shaman. Do you think it's gonna be a mech? Yeah, I think I, it'll I, be that I'm fast mech like. Shaman. Uh, Sixo's been playing that not only just on ladder and in some tournaments, but he played it in probably the biggest match he's ever played, which was like his round of eight in OGN, and he went 2-0 and in his group. So he's very confident with it. I mean, it, it can be kind of like an emotional choice where, oh, I did really well with this recently. I'm going to keep right. going with it. So, yeah. and I mean, it is, at worst, if he loses with it, you can say like, well, that was our sixth class. Like, it's not supposed to, you know, win every game. Yeah, I going, can see that. Going back to the, the Freeze Mage point, though, I feel like more and more Archon League is leaning, like, it doesn't favor Freeze Mage as much because, first of all, Shaman became a lot more popular. 
And I feel like some of the Neuralists, especially with that run Double Doomhammer and Leroy, they have just so much burst. And I, I know, Chalky, how familiar you are with Double Doomhammer and Shaman. I am, yes. man. It was it was crazy that, that no one else realized running two of a card is, is nice sometimes. But <laughs> yeah, it, right. it's just kind of that question of consistency, and especially in, in aggro decks, you really, in my opinion, have to be able to justify why you're running one of something and not two. And yeah. for Doomhammer, it is sort of justifiable because the, the diminishing returns on drawing the second one is really so bad. But uh, with, with most cards in these aggro decks, like uh, even Iron Beak Owl, stuff like that, when people run one, I'm kind of just like, why? Just, yeah. just put in a second one. Make it more consistent. Well, we missed the mulligan phase here, but uh, we do see the two players into their first game. So we do see the Leroy Jenkins. Turns out there is, in fact, going to be that exact version that we talked about before the match started. And a Mech Shaman with double Fireguard Destroyer. That's the one. Yeah, yeah. I don't even think this deck runs Fell Reaver. I, I don't know, Monk does it? It, it doesn't. It, it cuts both. It cuts pretty much all the BGH targets, like both Fell mm -hmm. Reavers, the... the um, the Dr. Boom and Ragnaros, and it pretty much like the highest curving cards are uh, Leroy, Lothab, and the Double Doom Hammers. Yeah, so it it really took one of those weak points out. Like if you, we kind of watched the, the Kibler playing around Big Game Hunter, but at that point, like if you really don't want to coin out a Fell Reaver on turn four, why, like, play? why, are, why are you playing that card? Yeah, so <laughs> that, that yeah. kind of became a big thing and players have started cutting stuff mm -hmm. like that, which makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I mean, no, it's I one of your biggest threats, and you want you don't even want to play it when you can to get the maximum swing potential, so there's really no point adding it to your deck. What were you going to say, Monk? Yeah, I was going to say, I, I kind of want to talk about the stats of this matchup, of course I right? always do. And uh, <laughs> usually the problem with like getting stats for decks that aren't too commonly played is that you just don't have huge sample sizes, like with Mech Shaman, for instance. But if you just go over like Shaman versus General Hunter, the uh, the stats are actually... Now. 13 to 1 in favor of Hunter. So that's like an extremely favorable matchup. 13 yeah. to 1? Wow, okay. Well, especially against Mech Shaman, I think it's actually really good just in that area. People might look at that and be like, okay, they beat mid-range Shaman, so what? But the, the Hunter cards line up super well with the early game in the Mech Shaman. Freezing Trap is insane, and 6-0 did get a pretty good... Uh, he, he got his Cogmaster frozen, which isn't a huge deal. But, like, imagine if there was a freezing trap up right now, that 7-6 is basically useless. And 6 doesn't really have a great way to proc freezing trap. Uh, there's just a lot of units on the board, and the Mech Shaman doesn't really play Lightning Storm or anything, so... Yeah, some variants have, but it's not exactly the most common card to include in that. Like, I, I've seen about two lists that run a single one of them, and even then... Um, you can't say that they're going to perform better generally. Like, maybe you tech it in against a specific metagame, but against the field, I think, uh... This is a, you know, more common deck. Well, that's a lot of damage output, though. Yeah. How easy is it to shut down? Um, he can kill the seven six off fairly easily and keep pushing some damage. And the four six isn't a huge deal. Uh, he'll probably be putting out like. So he has the option. He can put out Savannah High Main, or he can get out the Mad Scientist as soon as possible. Because the Mad Scientist, like I said, the freezing traps are so key in this matchup to to let you ignore a 6 health target, which basically means pushing 6 damage to face, which is equivalent to just having a Savannah I main down. Yeah, and what's crazy about it too is that because you have the Glaive Zuka, you can also remove the smaller threads that would otherwise eat up the Freezing Trap. So oh, it's man, giving well, you a bit more viability there. That's actually a like, pretty good totem there. Yeah, it's basically a heal for 7. It's going to get the 4 healing immediately, and then 6 was going to have to deal with it, so... This, <laughs> yeah, this amusing. almost like frees up Kibler to play the Savannah High Main. I wouldn't have minded seeing uh, like Juggler, Scientist, Glade, Zuka, or Hero Power. Yeah, and this is probably like the best matchup to get this in. As the Hunter player, you generally want to be very aggressive and you don't really care about healing. Except yeah, against if, the Mech Shaman that just has so much burst. Well, if you actually look at it, uh, Sixo's hand has 17 damage plus 4 on board. That, that'd be 21 over the course of 2 turns. That would actually just be lethal had Kibler not gotten that totem, so... As, as he might say, you know, he's sometimes fortunate, I believe it is. So, yeah, sometimes fortunate. That's exactly what he says. But, I like, there is still not out of it for 6 yet, because he's not quite dead. There's right. no double kill command in Kibler's hands. So, you know, getting a top deck of, a, let's say, a Crackle so could do it. I don't I, think, I think he has to kill the totem. Yeah, yeah. exactly. 
because it, <laughs> it makes no before. sense. Right. Right. It's like it, <laughs> that so, would have made no course, sense. Yeah. But it is a little surprising. He probably would have liked to efficiently remove it with like Rock Biter or Lightning Bolt because the damage lines up better and you get to get that four to face. But he had to kind of play out on curve with his minions. What to do? So now Kibler basically wants to. He wants to put himself in a safe position where he's not dead uh, over a few turns. But the best way to put yourself in a safe position against aggro is to make sure you're racing them as well. So, like, if Kibler could set up a two-turn lethal, that could be better than playing defensively, potentially, here. Yeah, if you do, if you get Earthshock, the Savannah Hymen here, you're going to kind of dislike uh, <laughs> what follows up. Yeah, but. yeah Sixo does play at least one Earthshock, I know. <laughs> I, I saw yeah. the list he played in OGM, so... That card is at least in his deck one time. It looks like Kibler is playing pretty defensively here, and... I, it I might think pay it, off it anyway. could work out pretty well, yeah. Yeah, I think it's very fair, especially since the Mech Shaman, it typically doesn't run as many minions as a, a hybrid hmm. hunter. Basically. He took one extra damage, yeah. Well, he noticed it immediately, but... Okay, so that probably won't get in damage, so 6 just is sitting on that, uh... How much yeah. damage does he have here? It's 17, so he needs 5 more. He needs 5 more from the hand, which is a lucky crackle away from the win, but he's got exactly one turn to find it, basically. And even, well, yeah. Yeah, the Leroy is really awkward, because that's what you <laughs> want to play first, because it doesn't overload. Right. But uh, it could die to the Knife Juggler, and even if it doesn't, it gives your opponent 2 extra power and 2 juggles. So, like, if those hit your face, are you really happy? Kill Command would kill you right afterwards. Assuming yeah, there's like so. another source of damage from the hand. So yeah, that would be a really risky move. But at the same time, like, is he just going to decide to hold on and wait for the Leroy? I mean, is it going to get better than this if a Freezing Trap comes out? If he smashes a Mad Scientist in, like, into something that you play? Yeah, you have to set yourself up to win, so this is probably correct. And, and it works. I'm not sure why he didn't Totem first, though. or Oh, play oh my god, and there it goes. <laughs> so that, that's Whole perfect. Yeah. yeah, this is This is just as good as he... Because he can and get it. Shitty lightning bolt, I guess it doesn't really matter. So hold on to it. And so I don't think this is lethal from Kibler. Uh, I don't think so. Oh, it is. Yeah. It Wait, is. it is? Six? It was, it was 20. Oh, yeah, it was the, the 21. It was 21 damage with the Yeah. Wow. 21. So, okay. <laughs> the, uh, the Vitality Totem honestly made a world of a difference that game. Sometimes well, fortunate, I guess. Well, there's a few cards. I mean, it's about to get a little worse with the new expansion, but not by a long shot. Um, well, there's that one that kills you even more that's coming, so... Right, there's the, there's the Wrath Guard, <laughs> there's the um, the guy that removes a mana crystal, and the one that can't attack unless you use your hero power, so Paladin Shredder got nerfed. Uh, a subtle least, nerfs. Subtle one, but I think it'll still be a pretty solid 4-drop, by the way. Well, first game for Value Town, so, uh, I mean... Kibler still takes another win, doesn't lose just yet, so is it going to be another flawless day for him? I don't know, he's got a druid lined up. That's a pretty tough one to steal a win with. Yeah, it really depends on what he can queue into. Like Monk said, the Freeze Mage is one of those surprisingly good matchups. Uh, so, like, Freeze Mage doesn't really expect to have many bad matchups. The Warrior is the one you expect, but when your opponents bring Druid, it's kind of like, okay, there's another really bad matchup. Mm -hmm. And uh, if Firebat's been playing Zoo a lot, so that's not that great. But if he did happen to bring Handlock, then the, the Druid could have been like a brilliant pick. No, I think there's no way Firebat is bringing Handlock. I don't think I've ever seen him play Handlock actually. Like, um, not in tournaments that I that yeah. I can remember. Not in tournaments at all. He, there, he's like kind a... of known for Zoo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's kind of a few like decks that Firebat never plays, even though he is known as. One of the players that plays the most decks overall. Like he doesn't play handlock, he doesn't play control warrior. And those are like pretty interesting decks, I'd say. For a while they were like dominant. So it's surprising. Like he probably plays them very well, but maybe he doesn't find them nearly as consistent or in line with his playstyle as um he like it's kind of weird though when you think about it, because it's they're so they're such strong decks. Well, in this format, it works out really well, because if you do think that you need to play Handlock, you can just give it to a teammate if you don't feel confident. Um, right. And they haven't... like. So I would say it doesn't just go to show that he doesn't want to play them. I would say they just don't think they're that strong right now. Like, there is Patron Warrior, there is Zoo. So, like, if those are stronger than the alternatives, then you just stick with those. 
Yeah, I don't see Control Warrior uh, making its way into the tournament. Like, I'm curious to know, though, if uh, we'll ever see Trump play the Zoo deck here in this format. Because I know he's a, like, an, like a handlock aficionado at this point. Um, and he likes to play the slow game. I don't know right. if he'd ever bring anything but handlock or maybe even I, demon law. Well, there is a lot of merit in just seeing what your opponents have played and kind of molding your lineup to that. I think a lot of a lot of teams, especially Value Town, do that. Like we've seen Value Town switch up not only tech choices but but deck choices quite a bit. Yep, so right. there must is, be a mistake here. Kibler already locked the game with his hunter, so this has to be another yeah. match coming right up. Um, I wonder if those that are actually the two players we're going to be playing because oh, no. never mind. Change of plans. It's going to be Firebat playing Warlock versus Dog's potential Freeze Mage. Mm -hmm. It has to um, be that. Yeah. Well, Dog has played Mech Mage before in a previous um, in a previous week, so I wouldn't like count him out like for that. But because Firebat or because Archon is known for playing Zoo, I would expect this mm -hmm. to be Freeze Mage. Like, they don't play Druid as often, and that's what you're really targeting with Mech Mage. Yeah, that that kind of goes back to looking at your opposition, and Value Tom does that a lot. They brought uh, Mech Mage a week where they knew they'd probably go into a lineup with Whoa. Druid and a lineup with Handlock. Handlock with Firebat. We were just talking about how he wasn't going to play yeah. that. You even what see Firebat fire oh, was like, Firebat was like faking the coin, which right. Dog probably was like, okay, so he has a knife juggler. Nope. And he's like, <laughs> this is yeah. a bad zoo hand. Oh wait. And what this is, is like the, up? this is like the perfect handlock hand against uh, Freeze Mage. Like you already have yeah. your two giants, which like, like th there are the cards that help you win the game or like that win you in the game, and then you have Ragnaros to follow that up. And right. I wouldn't even be surprised if Firebat kept Ragnaros in his opening hand. Yeah, no, no doubt about that. I think it's one of the cards. It's one of the few cards that really makes um, Freeze Mage awkward to play in the late game because it's much like Rogue. You kind of have to, uh, except it's worse. You kind of have to deal with it, but you can't quite do it very efficiently if you do it at all. So you might just throw away your win condition because you're trying to remove an eight-eight. Oh yeah, wow! So one thing is like, okay, so Archon decided they wanted to play Handlock. Uh, there is merit. There's small merit to keeping Firebat as the player of that class because, like you guys didn't expect it, it's kind of like when you see Firebat playing Warlock, he's played Zoo all the time. It's probably right. just Zoo. So, yeah, yeah I, I watch a lot of Hearthstone games, and like I said, I've never seen him play Handlock. And not only that, pretty much every tournament Firebat has ever won, he's played Zoo in. Like, mm -hmm, uh, yeah. like BlizzCon, obviously, Gfinity number one, Gfinity number two. And even the recent Star Ladder games, he played Zoo in. And pretty much every week of Archon League, or actually every week of Archon League, he played Zoo. Mm -hmm. Pretty big Zoo player, but sometimes you got to change it up in the team format, not be too predictable. And like you said, this hand is really solid to face off against Freeze Mage, especially since he picked up that Owl. That was really the one card I think he needed to draw at some point uh, to really lock up a dominant position. So now he's not vulnerable to, like, Frost Nova Doomsayer. Yeah, um, which is exactly I, what uh, Dog is yeah. lining up to do. But the thing is, Dog is then forced to find another source of Freeze to at least stall until he can remove those minions off the board. Or by the time he can do that, Firebat's going to be dropping his Ragnaros on the board, and then that's, that's going to be a bit problematic. I like this play from uh, from Doug. Yeah, it's it's pretty likely to get you eight health because your opponent doesn't really want to leave it there. Uh, he c Firebat could just go face. I mean, it is sixteen damage. He could like Lotheb to lock him out, but I mean, leaving an Emperor up against Freeze Mage is kind of risky. But the cards Dog really got Emperor aren't that insane. He's got a Lotheb. Firebat just picked up Lotheb as well, so he's got two safe. Yeah. Two safeguards, the double mountain, the Ragnaros. I mean, how do you throw this I away? I think he's going to Shadow Flame and Mortal Coil, yeah. Nice play. Mm -hmm. Doesn't really waste any damage is the main thing. You get to push the 16. You get to save Lothab and your Owl uh, and the oh. Hellfire, which can help to pop the second block. If that and the health there. of the Giants, too, because that's a meaningful thing. If they did lose, you know, one of them goes down to three health, it's that much easier to remove from Dog's perspective. So, again... Very well done. Yeah, this is... Okay, so he, because of the Emperor, he got to fit in the, the heal bot as well, which is pretty key. It's going to save him from getting popped this turn. 
Uh, and now, Fire Knight has to use the Owl on the Doomsayer, most likely. Well, yeah, of course, you use Why not? the Giant instead. <laughs> right. Just to uh, line up that Ragnaros shot better late game. Late game, you mean on the next turn? Mm. Something like that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, probably <laughs> soon enough. Soon enough. But there's a chance that Dog can pick up the damage output if Lothab is not played on time. I mean, he's got double Frostbolt Ice Lance. How far is he yeah. from getting like a Fireball and just sealing it? Because the, yeah. he's got two Ice Blocks and the Ice Barrier, so his life's not quite in danger just yet. And Pyroblast could also put him like really close to finishing because that's 11 in his hand right now. Or right. Yeah, 11 with the Hero Power. If you can fit in two more Hero Powers somehow, which with the second Ice Block is pretty likely, then if Fire Rat doesn't have the healing, uh, you can just burn him out with Pyroblast. Yeah, it's not that far off either. So Fire Rat's really weighing in on if he should play this Lothab or if he should just play a threat. Because the Lothab doesn't really s do much right now. Uh, we know from Dog's Hand, like, he probably didn't want to play that many spells. It does kind of deny, like, Arcane Intellect, but it's going to guarantee a pop next turn, essentially. Yeah. Now, what uh, what Dog does with his heal bot is going to give Firebat an indication of what's going to happen. I wouldn't be surprised if he just went full face with this at this point with the way uh, you have to play as Mage. Yeah, yeah that's think true. There's... He actually has the three damage from heal bot. I don't think he, like, there's not that much merit to clearing off minions since your opponent has lethal anyway, and you actually don't have any freeze effects in your hand. Yeah. So there's not really a point on freezing or, like, clearing off the board at this point. You could survive if you played Ice Barrier and like killed the Owl and then you'd be alive by one, I think. So that's probably not worth it because um, How do you Handlock, win? Has, Handlock has so many things to do one damage. Like that Defender Vargas would just pop the block anyway. And Earthen Ring Farseer could come in pretty big here for, for Firebat. Because I think what's going to happen is Dog's going to have to go for the bird next turn. He's going to set up the second ice block, and then he's going to try and draw into, like, Pyroblast or double Fireball. Yeah. Well, I mean, he's got at least one Fireball, possibly, from Arcane Intellect, almost reliably, considering, like, he's got about four draws to go. Um, but the Pyroblast yep. is going to be a little tougher to find. Yeah, and he's now I, I feel like the fact that Firebat went with that heal earlier, now Dog knows he needs more. He knows the Pyroblast won't be enough. But like you said, he gets, uh, I believe he actually gets five draws between now and when the game ends. He oh yeah, the Echolite of Pain, I didn't consider yeah. that one, you're right. Two, two draws for turn, two draws from Arcana Lock, and a draw, at least a draw from Acolyte of Pain. Uh, I would assume Firebat will probably kill that off. That way, Dog can't ping it. And what does Dog pick up is the Alex. Actually, whoa. Ooh. That no, could he help, can't, but he well, can't, he can't do it. it. He's dead. <laughs> yeah. You're right. One yeah, more Emperor one... Trigger would have been needed. Right. It was just barely too late. Uh, Blizzard doesn't really help much. Again, he's really looking for burn spells because he knows if you Blizzard right now, it's very likely that the Handlock can pop you anyway. I think you have to start going for that draw and start trying to burn your opponent. What to do? But how can you really get there? I guess you'd need the second Ice Lance and Pyroblast or double Fireball. So it's really unlikely. I mean, if you, yeah, I was going to say, if you Blizzard Ice uh, ice Block, your opponent has Dark Bomb to kill you. Like, in this case, yeah. he's got Ragnaros as well. So you're mm -hmm. kind of worried. Hellfire would help you, sort of. Cause you well, not the, really, because you didn't yeah, get Yeah, you would still off. die. To, yeah, you wouldn't be able to yeah. deal damage. So he needs to go for burn this turn, and he this needs so to get awful. the draws off. So oh. there's Pyroblast, but it, it's not enough without a second Ice Lance. Well, what about Nova? Well, no, he's got to go for the Frost Bolt. Yeah. Well, there's no way. Now he has to reconsider. Now I think you actually have to go for the Nova Ice Block. Yeah, definitely. Because even if you fire all this burn at your opponent's face, it's not enough. So it's a losing play line. Now this probably ends up losing him the game too, but it's basically what he has. Actually, wait, you Blizzard afterwards. Oh no, Rag's mm -hmm. going to finish it off. I was going to say, yeah, Blizzard could actually uh, help out. You could get a minion uh, to go along with the Blizzard. 
I'm a little surprised he didn't play Twilight Drake. Mm. Um, well, it, Blizzard it Mad Scientist maybe. could work, right? There's a chance. Yeah. There's a chance that Blizzard Mad Scientist Eyes Barrier works. A slight mm -hmm. chance. Or yeah, do you I don't try really think Blizzard? you need the Ice Barrier. I think you... What mm, you, probably you need the like, minion at least, right? Yeah, you definitely need the minion, and you want to hit... You either want to ping your opponent's face or fire off one of those Frost Bolts in one of the Ice Lances just to get the burn going. So he's betting on no Dark Bomb. If he's going for the Frost Bolt, the Frost Bolt Ice Lance here, he's betting on no Ragnaros, and either way he's dead to Dark Bomb. So oh, alright, so... That is game. This makes a lot of well. He basically has to go for this. Yeah. Uh, because if you play the mad scientist, you don't set your opponent to ten, and in that case, you still die. Yeah, you, you have to top deck the second blizzard next turn, and it just gets into this case of like, yeah, like you said, you're just going to die eventually. So he had to go for it that turn. Well, well played by both players, though. Even though in the end, uh, Firebat takes this, I think Dog's line of play was pretty good considering the pressure he was up against. I mean, that was a lot of. You know, a lot of threats from uh, from the handlock player. Mm -hmm. Oh, Monk is out. Hello, picture of Monk. Rip Monk. Yeah, rest in pepperonis. Uh, it was it was a really uh, well played game from Firebat. He did get fortunate draws, but I think it was mostly just also a smart decision to bring handlock in the first place. It was a bit of a surprise. We don't really know if Dog Mulliganed in correctly or anything, but it was definitely not something that Value Town was really expecting going into preparation for this week. Yeah, another deck's locked too, so that's going to give uh, the surprise factor the expected you know outcome, where you don't have to really replay that deck afterwards once you've sprung the trap on your opponent. Because sometimes you bring a surprising deck and then it loses, and then everybody knows what's coming, and yeah. that's just terrible. <laughs> Whereas in this case, uh, Firebat piloted the deck to, to the win, so it ended up working out pretty nicely. Um, so I wonder if Dog's going to be re queued at this point. It, like, the benching rule still doesn't... Like, how penalizing would the benching rule be in this position? So the main issue of the benching rule, like, if Dog were to be benched, that means Rogue and Mage can't be played. And so Archon would then want to queue the decks that do best against mm -hmm. everything else. So I'm not sure it has too much implication because Rogue and Mage aren't really, like, that kind of... Yeah, they don't everything. really hard counter that much stuff. I guess you would throw out maybe, like, your own Rogue because you would have be sure to avoid the freeze mage matchup uh so that could maybe help but other than that it's really not a huge deal and there's also kind of like this this mind game where there's two ways to look at it okay your opponent's lost they probably don't want to send out the same player but at the same time is that more likely than any other deck it's basically like 20 percent just across the board if they roll the dice uh to see which deck they'd pick but yeah, are they, they more just... likely than that to send out Dog again? Yeah, that's actually a good question. Um, like, I, I don't think they'll send out Druid from Kibler, although he could try to lock down the win now. It's just that he's not likely to queue into a matchup that he really likes. And if he faces, faces off against Rogue, some people debate uh, which of the two classes has an edge in the matchup, like Rogue versus Druid. Um, like, some people have started giving it back to Druid for a while Rogue was considered dominant. Uh, do you think do you think either way, it's like a coin flip, or is there one that like clearly is superior to the other? I think Monk would say stat wise, Druid has done best against Rogue. Uh, it's got yeah. the best of it a little bit, but again, Rogue players are the kind of the type of players to stereotype a bit that will say that they're favored in that matchup. Of course, kind of yeah. Thinking, there's a little bit of confirmation bias, right? Yeah, I'll yeah, just, yeah, yeah. Uh, I win everything, so... No, my, no, my no, you just, you just have to draw Prep Sap and Sprint yeah, and, <laughs> and Minions and yeah, Blurry. Dude, don't you know Prep Sap, Prep Eviscerate for Tempo is like my convenient turn 6 play after I drop uh, I drop something on the board? And I have so, Vile Teacher, of course. This might have been just pure luck. I, yeah. I, I feel kind of bad talking about it, but like... This is technically the mind game here. Like I said, you'd want to play Rogue if you don't think they'd send out Dog. But then from well, Value Town's point of view, if you think they're going to do that, you just send out Dog again. Yeah, and with, this, with the Freeze Mage, which in this yeah. case is pretty well off. So, so Value Town kind of got the best of this uh, matchup queue, whether that was maybe mind games or just luck. Who knows? All right, I think Monk might be back with us. Oh, he doesn't seem to hear us. Monk, come back. 
<laughs> oh, well, no we worries. We miss you. All right, so Mad Scientist gets developed early on. Not really a big deal. I think what's really important here is Dog already has his Emperor Thorsen for later, so it's a good deal. Yeah. And this is a really kind of strange hand from the mage. Like, he has so much burn that you almost feel bad about using it for removal, but one of the things is if the rogue pressures you enough, uh, you do end up having to use quite a bit of burn just on their minions. Like, if a Violet Teacher comes out next turn, one of the best responses to that is to just fireball it. Right. Uh, one of the best responses is 3-2, and the 3-3s three is just Frostbolted. But if you use up all your burn, it, it's kind of a lot harder to win. Yeah, so it's it actually really going to be problematic for him if he just throws yeah. out his burn as removal. I think this is one of the few cases where that's the last thing you want to do. Yep. It's, uh, it's one of those things where you really you want, like, uh, Blizzard and Flame Strike because you can't point those at face, so you feel fine throwing those out. But in the early game, if the Rogue pressures you too much, uh, you do feel really bad about kind of just leaving the minions out there. So Dog's just going to get rid of the Frostbolt knowing, yeah, it's a lot of burn, but you also have to survive to the point where burn is relevant. Uh, so there's two Auto Barbers in that Rogue deck. All right, so... That's a lot of... I, I, did he expect an aggressive deck to be played out here? Because that, that two-drop uh -huh. is not... Is it that typical? I no. haven't seen as much of it it's... like as a two-of. I've seen one-ofs very frequently, but... I think you could expect an Assassin's Blade, maybe, as that card goes really well with that. And mm -hmm. that's... There's not much you can do about that from Dog's point of view. Like, if he draws Assassin's Blade, you're unhappy because it's just so much damage. But uh, it, it is kind of one of those newer lists. I forget who exactly made that rogue list, but it, it does just kind of play auto barbers for a little more aggression. Uh, sometimes plays Assassin's Blade. I, I think it might have been Mr. Yuku. At least I saw him playing it a lot. Yeah, I've seen a lot of people put in Assassin's Blade. Like, it, it in one week, it kind of uh, set itself back in the metagame all of a sudden, and it took everyone by surprise. Unfortunately, it kind of suffers from the same problem as Control Warrior does very often, where People are starting to tech against weapons as a result of Dream Patron, and as a result, Control Warrior is suffering from it, and Rogue is also partially in a, you know, kind of the mm -hmm. friendly fire, I guess you could say. Crossfire, rather. Yeah. So Just kind of taking collateral damage from the fact that Patron is so... Good. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, hated. <laughs> I don't know. It's uh, probably... It, I almost want to say it's one of the best deck that's ever hit Hearthstone. Um, yeah. Like relative, even in the context of all the relative power of other decks in their time and in their prime, I think Grim Patron is just shattering records. Yeah, and the fact that it's so good, because I also feel like one of the things is the scene has developed so much to where they're, everyone's playing a lot better than we used to. I mean, back when Miracle Rogue was a thing uh, and kind of just hitting the surface, a lot of the decks weren't really refined. A lot of them could have been a lot better. Right. And... Now everyone kind of has refined decks. Everyone's playing really well, and still Patron is it's destroying people. Yeah, you would expect that when you... I think one of the, the, the strangest things about Patron is that whenever you end up teching against it, it doesn't take long for you know the metagame to shift to where Patron can suddenly come back up to counter those counter decks to the counter decks. It's like the, the, the cycle is very quick, uh, whereby Patron mm -hmm. will come back in to be relevant. Oh, man. You know, 6 does have... That prep sap and that loath of. Yeah, he could just double tinkers and hit face this turn. Yeah. <laughs> That'd it's be dog 20 dog. across two turns. It might force out just like Ice Lance from Dog out of fear. Uh, looks like he's, he's going to be a little more patient than that, though. Pretty interesting that he just pops the loath up this early. Like, it's not really denying much from dog it's going yeah. to set up an oil target so maybe next turn he'll have lethal and that's probably what he was going for like if you prep double tinkers oh wow it was right even devil prep yeah. wow that is nasty burst okay yeah, yeah definitely each what tinkers was going for. each tinkers is worth um six damage and the abyss is worth four so that's 14 19 23, so he actually would have been one off popping it. That'd be awkward. There was a heal bot anyway, so. And there's also an ice barrier, so he's not really that close, uh, even though he has all of this damage. Dog has had all of the healing. Yeah, the, the, what the, that's kind of the awkward thing about uh, playing all rogue is that very often you do get huge bursts, but against a deck like Freeze Mage, 
very often you're short of a little bit of damage, and unless one of your minions sticks on the board, which tends not to happen, uh, getting recurring damage in is very tough. So you start eventually relying on the, that little last ditch dagger hit that you're hoping will do something, but it's mm -hmm. often too late because then they start healing up with Healbot, Alexstrasza, name it, and uh, suddenly you're out of reach. Or you're dead, yeah. of course. Yeah, I mean, Sexo's gotten double sprint. He's gotten two preps with both oils and all of this damage. It's like, you can't really ask for much more, but at the same time, he's still quite a ways off killing Dog. Yeah. So he's gonna get it started, though. This is gonna be pushing for 21 this turn. <laughs> oh, man. Well, if there were ever a time for Acidic Swamp Boost. I suppose this would be it. I mean, Doug still doesn't quite. Oh, never Ooh, mind. Never that mind is, that. That is lethal, that is right? So that is so big. That is so sick. Yeah. That all, changes all... everything because <laughs> he, he was over. just going to have to. Uh, he was just going to have to fireball that Lothab this turn and play defensively. But now, suddenly, he has a much better game plan. Yeah. Well, Alex draws out of face and win. Right. That, that sounds well, like a decent to, game plan. I feel like that's going to be it. Yeah. He has to go for that, but. Dog is thinking, like, okay, my opponent's used a lot of damage. I could go for a defensive plan. I could Alex myself later. Um, my opponent's pretty likely to have a heal bot or an Earthen Ring Farseer. He already used Lotheb, so that's out of the way. I feel like even without thinking about the hands, so, you know, obviously we have, like, caster bias. There is no heal. Go for it. Right. But uh, even yeah, you... without that knowledge, this is probably his best chance of winning. Yeah, if he had been playing around Healbot, uh, in a case like this one, it might have looked like an Ice Lance on uh, Lotha, but then you expect Blade Fury, so your Alex Strauss is dead, ergo you have yeah. no win condition. So by doing this, Dog is setting himself up to where he can still win from hand, assuming his opponent doesn't both trade away his Lotha, in which case he doesn't have immediate lethal, um, and he can't pop your Ice, uh, your ice Block right away. Yeah, it's a really nice situation. Going to be a he did not draw a heal. He didn't have a heal, so Dog's kind of sweating it over there, but once he realizes <laughs> there's no right. heal, it's pretty good life. Yeah, so this this pirate's a little important for Sixo because he gets to take his opponent to four, which is conveniently right in the range of Eviscerate for next turn. But obviously this is just wishful thinking for him, hoping Dog doesn't have the, the kill. I mean, at this point, if you've seen him, Alex, your face, you have to assume. And, you know, he hasn't been really playing the uh, Flame Strike or Blizzard game. So you kind of have to assume it. And Dog's going to yeah, steal was... the game with his, mat, with his uh, Freeze Mage, so that's out of the way for him. Mm hmm. Such a pretty shocking win. It really seemed like Sixo had a really insane draw that game, and Dog, I guess, just had just enough. Uh, didn't really draw into much cycle that game. It was basically just the burn and the top deck Alex on turn nine. Yeah, well, it's uh, if he hadn't drawn that Alex Straza, the game might have gone to 6 if only just because he's mm -hmm. got more sustain, whereas in this case, as you said, Dog would have had to fireball Lothab um, yeah. or start, you know, Ice Lancing to stall, which doesn't feel good at all. That would have been a losing play. Over time, it would have been very unlikely that he comes back unless he top decks perfectly after that point. Yeah. Well, so, the value town takes the lead once again. Uh, really, neither team has gotten any of those kind of big wins out of the way. I would say we kind of talked about Shaman and Druid are, are the weak links, if there are any, for these two lineups. So you really want to get good matchups for those and hopefully get a win. I'd say if those ma if those decks go head-to-head, -head, the Shaman's pretty favored. Uh, it's yeah, one of those matchups I, I would, that would really venture to say on. so. It plays like Zoo a little bit, right? In the same way that Druid mm -hmm. has a really tough time spot removing minions that have just a little bit too much health, and Mech Shaman's pretty good getting those minions on the board. And at some point, unless you're running a weird variation with Wild Pyros and Starfall, um, there's no way you're going to get them off the board. It's just so difficult. Like, I don't think we'll see uh, any Mill Druid coming from Kibler anytime soon. <laughs> That'd be pretty interesting to throw out Mill <laughs> Mil Druid when you're nine and zero, competing for five thousand dollars for hey, having the best record. Wouldn't that just be like the most BM thing to do? Just to throw yeah. it out there, and be like, yeah, you see, I can win with Mill Druid as well. I can man. win with anything. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I am the master of duels. Yeah. Oh man, that'd be that'd be really epic though. If we saw a volcanic <laughs> lumber, you remember that tides list that he played? Yeah, that, I do. That, that was so good. Oh man, Kibler, if you're if you're uh, listening, please swap decks. You know, I think even if Kibler cheated and changed his list to Mildred, nobody would really mind. 
Yeah. Uh, I think they'd still be fine with it. Yeah. <laughs> be like, Even no, we'll the organizers would <laughs> be like, you know what? That's fine. We haven't seen that in a bit. All right. Sixto versus Trump. So Sixto is getting queued up again. If he loses this, he's going to get benched. Uh, I mean, Dog did just dodge the bench by winning with his freeze mage prior to this. And if Sixto wins with his shaman against the uh, patron warrior, we have to assume from Trump, then, uh, you know, he'll dodge it as well. How favored do you think uh, Patron Warrior or Shaman is in this matchup? Well, this is kind of one of those newer matchups, especially. It's a newer Shaman deck. It hasn't been tested as much. Monk would, you know, talk about how there's not a big sample size for this. Right. I, I wish I, I wish I had his statistics because I actually don't know too much about this matchup. Um, I have to imagine the Shaman deck does okay against Warrior because it feels like if if a new deck pops up. And it's a good deck in the meta. Surely it does well against Patron Warrior, right? Yeah, like, I, I think uh, Shaman is like 60-40, maybe. If I, yeah, if I, it's uh, definitely close. Yeah, it's got to be like slightly favored maybe for the Shaman, but not by a you know massive margin. But it's nice to have, at least. Yeah, one of the actual important things is some Patron players have been cutting Fire Your X. Uh, cutting one of them. Mm -hmm, and yeah. it's a pretty big draw against Mech Warper decks, and they have been falling out of the meta, but as they come back, it's like, I think people are going to realize Fiery War Axe is a pretty good card again. <laughs> well, I wonder, though, like, with that new card coming out, the King's Defender, I, I, I know it's probably not going to replace the War Axe, I am fully aware of this, but <laughs> I have hope that we'll see, especially with that bolster card, a taunt-oriented warrior crop up as an alternative to control and patron. I would just Ooh, love it, to see something like it. It looks it. like it is control. Um, so we've oh seen, man. I think we saw Trump play this once so far, if I'm not mistaken, in Archon League, and it's... I'm not sure if it's really going to give him much of an edge in this, in this matchup, like... I feel like you might rather be the patron warrior here. Um, oh, wow. I, th I think so, by, a, by like maybe another 5% again in yeah. favor of the... So it's like 65-35 looking like 6 here. here. Um, yeah, wow. Brawl might be important. Because it looks like 6 draw is just going to line up to be really minion heavy. Yeah. Well, shield oh, block. Oh, I was gonna. Draw, I was yeah. gonna say shield block would be crazy too, but turns out he draws it right afterwards to combine Ooh. with the shield slam. So he's gonna he's save slammed. it. He he could have just shield blocked, shield slammed this, and set up for a death bite the next turn. But I guess he realizes that that would just be going into a uh, fire guard destroyer most likely, so it wouldn't really get the job done. One important thing is Trump does have Harrison, and if that lines up into a doom hammer, that's. Not game problem. over, but it's, it's pretty ridiculous. Yeah, like Power Maze can dodge the massive drawback in the case where there is a mech. At least as a warrior, if you have the, the Harrison Jones, you can get initiative on trading into the mechs uh, in order to avoid the Power Maze doing anything. But Doom Hammer is what you're looking to steal there. Wow, and Sixo is actually going to go ahead and remove that Shredder entirely and set up another Anoyotron. I guess really fearing the Death Spike coming out on 4, which Trump did have, so... In theory, uh, I think the logic behind his play worked out here. I I'm still not sure. I feel like developing a Fire Destroyer is it's pretty strong. Yeah, I I'd almost say it's the stronger play. I mean, what's the worst that could happen? Cruel cool Taskmaster execute? That would be mm -hmm. bad, but at the same time, the, the Anoitron is going to be able to tank you know, one of the hits, and that's kind of forcing him to have another weapon to clean up the Anoitron. And you've got the Shredder on the back end, so uh, I, I like what you're saying. Okay, well there's Lothab, so that lines up a bit better into his mana curve. Uh, next turn he can go for like Crackle and Piloted Sky Golem, or Piloted Shredder, or the Fire Guard Destroyer. So it's an awkward turn for Trump, like very awkward. <laughs> Would've been what? great if there was no Lothab effect. Yeah, but like he can still get a shield block double shield slam for the double yeah. whammy here on two minions that he wants to remove. Which could be very important. Ooh, Taunt Totem is huge. Best Totem in the game against Warrior. That guy's Totem is crazy. <laughs> I can't be the Totem like that. He needed exactly that one. Oh, man. Well, Dalek Straza is also not that bad. Yeah. Uh, it's it's going to help him stabilize later. Right. But... For the immediate sense. Like, in the immediate sense, it's not stellar, but it can help a little bit. Uh, hopefully, if he kills the Shredder, there's not a 3-2 with Wind Fury that comes out of it. Alright. 
Yeah. So despite the uh, despite the taunt totem, Trump's still in a pretty fine spot. Oh, that's a pretty nice pickup for for six. So he can play that and the fire guard destroyer this turn, really start pushing damage. And he's got he's got a little bit of burn in his hand. Yeah, he's got to be liking that top deck. Unfortunately for him, it's going to backfire slightly because you know <laughs> Trump can handle it very nicely. But yeah, in other he's circumstances, he's not going to get the death rattle. Mm -hmm. Worst place for the sword to go. It's a 50-50, but... Uh, yeah, he's not going to get the death rattle, assuming Trump just swings before playing Harrison. Which we have to assume he's going to do. And what's nice for Trump as well is that the Harrison is played on the same turn. You can also armor up on the back end, so you get to weave in that extra health that's going to protect you against some of the burst later on. Very nicely mm -hmm. on turn 7. Yeah, he could even pick up. He does have both executes in his deck, and an execute would be just... Huge here. Man, if he finds it off yeah. of the Harrison Jones. It's only one draw, but at the same time, it's the draw that could just turn the game completely upside down. Yeah. The 6-0 is still in a pretty okay spot. No. Still not too bad. I mean, it's yeah. the, you're forcing your opponent to have an extra lava burst. For each shield block you're playing, you're forcing him to have that. And oh, oh my god. Oh my god. <laughs> What an insane draw from Tixo well, here. Well, ever a draw you want to draw after Harrison hits the board, this is it. This is I an insane pickup for Tixo. Yeah. And it's just going to be all face, and that's a lot of damage next turn. Trump does have a shield block to sustain a little bit. So there is potential he can make it to that Alex Straza turn and survive. And the healing totem too. I mean, it's getting the fire guard destroyer out of range of Harrison Jones, killing it since it was damaged by a one. Oh, he got this the healing totem. Hell. Yeah, I didn't even realize. <laughs> that is the worst. But you know, Trump, oh, no. Trump can recognize the value in what Six O's RNG gave him here. Like he, everybody, he can. might just be dead because of healing totem. Because if he could just trade into that fire destroyer, then uh, Six O would have thirteen to sixteen damage, and Trump would be at seventeen. Right. So he'd be alive and then he get Alex next turn. So everything would be okay. But like the healing totem adds four. It, he needs to find a way to remove that fire guard destroyer. So Shaman's got a new totem, two mana, deal four damage to the opponent. That sounds super balanced, Shocky. <laughs> yeah. Balanced. It's uh it's pretty big here. I I don't know what Trump can really do. I mean you have to probably start with shield block. I'd assume so, yeah. I mean, if only to get the extra oh, health, maybe. Oh, he's just maybe. gonna rag. And that's it. And he's, he's gonna die no matter what happens here, but he's gonna be trying to 50-50, hoping Kixel's out of burst. But uh, we know for a fact he's got, you know, more than enough just in hand. Yeah. Oh, do you, do you act like you top decked him? <laughs> you oh, should. no, you go, go for the crack. Wow. Is, oh, I didn't go I... for any PM. No, he did. Oh, he, he actually crackled face. himself. Okay. Okay. So uh, so for Trump, there's like that millisecond where you're like, oh, did he screw up? No. Yeah. Oh, wait. <laughs> never mind. This is what you, what's called giving hope to someone and then just crushing it all away. Uh, Sixo going to pick up a win here with a shaman, so he's not going to get benched. He's going to dodge it the same way Dog did. That was a pretty cool match. Uh, like some of the some of the value from the stone claw and the healing totem was just out of this world. Sixo, a shaman master. He's really... Learned how to summon the right totems. Yeah. Uh, th to be fair, the taunt one would have been pretty good there, too. Right. Uh, so it was more like a 50-50 than a 25%. Oh, you're right. And yeah, oh. so... I, I would say overall, though, I didn't see any mistakes from Sixo. I thought he held on to his burn spells at the correct time. Mm -hmm. uh, which really... You have to realize that you can't really afford to remove too many minions. You just need to save Crackle for face and all that, and... At the end, he had way overkill, but... Yeah, it yeah. was it was well played out of the way. I mean, he couldn't guarantee that he was going to find the Doom Hammer that he wanted. So it turned out, uh, turned out pretty well. Both players played, but when the cards line up, of course... You know, at this level of play, very often it comes down to uh, people piloting properly, which very often they do, and then the hands being... You know exactly how you want them. Now we'll be moving on to the next uh, next game very shortly. In the meantime, if you guys want to tweet anything, hashtag ATLC. Uh, we'll show up the uh, the tweets on the stream. If you know you have any ideas about who's going to be playing what and who's going to play what uh, and whom, it's going to be pretty nice. If uh, you have predictions, feel free to share them. Is it just me or that dragon look a lot like Kibler on this image? <laughs> I mean, it is it is his dragon. Like, 
I, I don't know. I, th I think it's just supposed to be Twilight Whelp. But... <laughs> So let, let me get this straight. Kibler has pointy teeth. This is a Twilight whelp. Twilight is okay. a movie about vampires. Kibler is a vampire confirmed. Am I doing this right? I think you're doing it right, yeah. All right, that's good. I just wanted to make sure. All right, so it's well, late. Spe speaking of Kibler, this is, this is it. I mean, he could go 10-0. and 0. Yeah. This is the match to do it. We so have to pretty, assume Zelay's playing Patron. I mean, he's been playing it yeah. all the time. It's just... Uh, it's a player... One of the few players that you just pin on archetypes and you... Like, in the olden days, you could do that as well, where you would pin players on specific decks, but as time passed, they've had to di diversify their uh, their ability. Yeah. To, to play it's, multiple decks, so... It's now very it's, outspoken about liking the Patron Warrior deck and how good right. it is. Yeah. I don't think it's too big of a deal. I mean... Trump did go ahead and try to get a little bit of a surprise factor, but also I think the control warrior pick lines up pretty well into everything Archon has left, like Rogue, probably Freeze Mage, Hunter, that might even be just Aggro Hunter. Like The control warrior pick might end up being a pretty nice pick from Trump, uh, not only just for a surprise factor, but because it might just be better. Well, I'm not too sure what, uh, what the players are waiting for to start the game, but it should be happening pretty soon. Well, Killer with Druid, like, how favored is Druid against Patron anyway? Like, is it just um, because of the um, the excessive amount of birds? Like, the Shades of Nax could actually matter quite a bit? It's it's pretty close. Yeah, the Shades of Nax are actually pretty key because not only do they represent so much damage, but if you get out two, it really shuts down the possibility of your opponent just making a bunch of patrons and saying good game, like, because those shades always threaten to just pick off a patron, and then you hear power one down, and you wrath the fourth one, and it's like, okay, there go your patrons. Uh, Druid is... I know the, the opinions on this matchup have changed a lot, but the one thing that Druid definitively does is it's one of the few decks that can pressure patron warrior a lot to the point where they have to try to be the aggressor. And so you'll see a lot of players throw out Frothing Berserkers, throw out Grim Patrons, just try to get ahead on board against Druid, knowing Druid struggles to come back. But it is very close to 50-50. All right, so it's all about... Basically, it's they're both playing for the board, and you're trying to put the warrior in a position where he's going to have to overextend aggressively before he's ready to do so, and OTK you. And then you can pick off the win, if anything. Yep, so... It will be kind of the warrior trying to force out the board. And the druid, obviously, as always, will be looking for, like, innervate wild growth. Uh, just looking to pressure really early and make the patron warrior make bad plays. For no one. Alright, so... Alright, that worked. It's it Monk! Did. Welcome back. Welcome back, Monk! You were gone for a while there. What happened to you? Did you get uh, forgotten in the Twisting Nether? Well, there were some uh, Skype issues, but you know, this is uh, we do live in the technology sphere. And uh, we are on the base of, of technology, so once my screen gets loaded up, uh, how's everyone doing so far? How is each team doing so far? It's two to two, so yeah, it's we're a pretty great, tied up. Great match so far. Uh, the series has been pretty good. I mean, the matches, like, some of the lineups were really favored in one or the other player's uh, side, but it hasn't been complete a, a complete blowout so far in either of the games that we saw. Monk, I miss you. I miss me too sometimes. Monk, we were we were lost without your statistics. We were like, yeah, we were trying to this bring up, up stats. Yeah, it's like, oh, for, like Shaki, what do you I think of this? <laughs> what does Monk so, think of this? So for this matchup, it's what going to be um, in, like it's very debated upon, but most people consider this like around 50-50. Some like some oh, patron man. warrior players consider it I like above 50-50. Yo, Shaki, uh, like, you nailed that. That was, like, perfect analysis. Nice. You could be Monk, uh, too. 
I know, <laughs> but like, if you just want to go by stats, it's uh, four, right now it's 47 to 37, so that's a 56% win rate. Wow. But the argument is always that like the Druid is much easier to play um, compared yeah. to the uh, Patron Warrior. So if you play it at an optimal level for both players, like some would argue that it's actually either 50-50 or slightly favored towards the Patron. Depending well, on who uh, who plays the deck. Yeah, I can see that. Kibler did not draw Wild Growth or Innervate. Good it, game. Is this, is this what it takes to end the 9-0 streak? Could this be it? He's been doing very well like for Innervates and Wild Growth when he played it. I think he played it like two weeks straight, right? He played Druid, and he's right. gotten the ramp every time, if I recall. Yeah, he definitely played it against us oh, no. very fortunately, but... Uh, I'm not sure if he played it a second time or not. I know he's played a lot of Mech Shaman and been pretty outspoken. I mean, his Mech Shaman starts weren't like auto wins. You know, he did have a lot of decision making. Uh, it was basically you can look at those games and be like, Kibler made choices to win those games. So you can't really take much away from him. Uh, yeah. Over once once you start racking up, you know, like nine wins in a row, it's like how much can you really say is RNG at this point? Yeah, especially against a field that's so stacked. I mean, it's kind of hard to start demeaning the, the accomplishments. So what do you play in Kibler's position here? I mean, you kind of want to deal with that frothing, but at the same time, the Shredder is such a good play that it's hard to deny. If there's a weapon, then you run into issues. So yeah. it's kind of a tricky spot, I feel. Well, I think you have to keep her the, yeah, keep her the Acolyte to deny the draw, but now you're like, okay, please don't have Death Fight. Please don't have Death Fight. Yeah, please no weapon. Well, yeah, even if he has us, but you can Harrison it, but then the uh, Frothing Berserker. The Frothing is going to get Yeah, nuts. it gets out of control. Yeah, that's that's pretty much the major issue here. I guess you could Wrath it afterwards, though, in that position, right? Like, because it's going to go, sure, it's going to go, like, completely out of control for one turn, perhaps. <laughs> but then you could... That's Well, that's enough, right? <laughs> I guess one turn's enough when you're playing Frothing, but... Yeah, that's, that's the major issue, is if your opponent kind of runs away and you're playing on the defensive so much when you really start to turn the game. Now, that can happen. Uh, there was actually like a crazy patron versus druid game between Kalinto and Life Coach earlier today at Gamescom, uh, where Life Coach went down to one health as the druid player, and Kalinto ran out of every single card in his deck and couldn't finish him by one health. So the druid can kind of take a defensive position and come out on top. It's just, it's pretty rare for that game, for this matchup to go that late. Yeah. Well, we saw the keeper. We we still have a wrath in Kibler's hand. So if there is, you know, some kind of funky patron play next turn with the, you know, Grim Patron Inner Rage Whirlwind, swipe being used is not really a big deal since you really want to use it. But without the keeper, and you've only got a wrath left, like how do you how will you handle this? Well, Zale does have the option to be a bit greedy and go for it now. He'd get punished by like he could. He he'd could, get punished yeah. by Savage Roar Wrath would be able to clear. Uh, but then he'd get a free Emperor off, so I think that's what he's thinking here is worst case He gets an empty board into an Emperor next turn, which is you know pretty nuts. Oh okay. Wow double, double wrath. wrath for Kibler. That's a draw Kibler. He yeah. recognizes it just nods wildly at the, at the, the Kibler camera. nod. Yeah. yeah, the Kibler nod like hey, that's a good card. I think that's a good card. Is it a good card guys? I think it's a good card. Well, the nice thing about this is now the Emperor can come down and because yeah. Um, like one swipe is has been used and two rats been used, uh, and Kibler doesn't have a board, then that emperor will probably stay alive for the next turn. Yeah, this is this is looking still pretty good for Zelay. I mean, I at first I wasn't really liking the aggressive play, but once I considered like at worst you just get to emperor on an empty board next turn, like that's pretty nuts. Yeah. So does Kibler have to? I mean, he's got the top deck and answer to the emperor right now. There's really nothing. Oh wow, is that it? Well. Does he, he do does, it? He has Druid of the Claw and Hero Power to do it as well. Uh, he could also just Ancient War, but that's really risky if your opponent has Execute. Uh, he would end up getting very punished for that. So, well, I, I, I think yeah, you're right. Like the, the but it, play it is, is like the winning kind of line, though. Like you, you can't assume your opponent has everything. You can't keep defending. Uh, you have to turn this game around at some point. So that's why I think that this is a pretty justifiable play. I mean, that execute is going to be devastating. Yeah, he can I, draw five cards this turn uh, with Acolyte and Battle Rage and get rid of the Ancient War for free. Yeah, I, that, that, sounds, that sounds absolutely insane. Yeah. 
it's that has just to be ridiculous. the play. It spends three mana to do that. And then three he's got four left five. over, because, you know, why not? Yeah, exactly. It's just like, he's going to get so much value off of all this and be so ahead on board. It's yeah. going to be ridiculous. People hail um, Grim Patron and Frothing Berserkers as the win conditions in that deck. I think it's like, it's almost Emperor Warrior sometimes, because that card alone can win you. Like, most of the matches where you find it, I think you'll pull out ahead, like, vastly more than if you didn't. Like, the win percentages between finding it and not finding it, I think, must be disgustingly high. Yeah, and I think Kibler figured he was fishing for the execute, but it turns out Zilli just had it, so... It was pretty calculated by Zelay. This worked out really well. I didn't really see a different play than this, and it's going to put him in a really dominant position to be the first person to take down Kibler. So what do you t what do you do if you're the first person who takes down Kibler? Like, what happens? Do you, do you get something uh, like the defeater of the Master of Duels? Like, do you get a special title? Uh, I don't know. If there's only one loss on Kibler's record, though... Like, that could be crazy as well. Like, Zillay could say, I'm the only guy who beat him. It's all on you guys. I, I, I did so, nothing. All skill, yeah. Yeah, of I course. De I denied him that wild growth draw. <laughs> I got the right totems. I denied him the wild growth. We're a Easy good team. Game. Yeah. Well, for, for Kibler here, there's really not much going. Um, you can't really mount an offense when your opponent's a warrior at 31 health. Um, you can't really, you can clear this board with like force of nature here, clear off two of the minions and... That's the only yeah. option I think that's going to maybe yeah. bring him anywhere near victory. I think he's relegated to a defensive plan here and the problem with that is if the patient warrior draws infinite cards, uh, eventually they'll kill you. <laughs> and the one fraud is out, there's one patron left. Mm -hmm. So I guess at this point you're worried about the second patron and the second fraud thing. Those are the two big threats. The weapons also do add up quite a bit of damage, but they're not yeah. what you're most worried about at this point. It's just that even if you do get a good board, if the opponent has another execute, you're also out of it. Like, it doesn't take long for you to just get thrown out of the game. Yeah. Uh, Zelay didn't have to use much stuff inefficiently this turn. Like, an execute hit a 7-mana taunt for 0 mana. He drew five cards on that same turn. It's like it's just not what it needs to be for Kibler here. He need he would need Kibler to throw out cards more inefficiently. This is a little inefficient, but the fact that Kibler doesn't have a way to clear hit makes it a fine play. Like I think that's what Zlay's thinking here is he has both war songs, he might as well start pushing damage, and Kibler probably can't respond. Kibler is smiling. I'm not sure if he's smiling at the ridiculousness of the fact that you can pay two mana to draw a tenth of your deck. Or if he's smiling at the fact that his opponent has a second fraud thing. I'm not, I'm not sure. This is the end. <laughs> My this is the end for me. Oh. It's still it's still the end. But yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it was a Yeah. Where shall I start? Yeah. I don't know. Hey, Kibler Kibler's gotta feel a little uneasy about the outcome of this, but then again, you know, no ramp, that's gonna put you in a position that's just awful to begin with. Yeah, I mean, again, from his point of view, like, if you want to look at things from, like, the positive side, he's not playing the best decks, right? Like, he's not right. the guy playing Patron. He, he, he had to take Druid for his team this week. It's, it's not the greatest deck in the game, and you have to expect to lose a bit. 9-1 and one is still an insane record. Yeah, considering the decks he's been playing, which were initially considered all underdogs, pretty much, and he's been doing very well with them all, uh, you know, there's there's no shame in losing here against Patreon as a Druid player. Especially when we said, you know, it's kind of a coin flip, depending on whom you ask, so... And and the series isn't over yet. I mean, they, they did fall behind here, but it's not completely out of it. They do really need to find that Druid win, and I was just kind of thinking about it. There is a little bit of merit to, like... If, if you're not in a great spot, maybe you just don't have Kibler play to kind of hold on to his record. Yeah. Uh, you know, throw that that would have been, like, there. you guarantee the, the fact that he's going to be free, like, queuing up against Freeze Mage, right? Like, you try to bait him with that. You're like, you know, you can play Druid and Shaman, and we'll give you all those classes, but, you know, you also get to get the good matchups. We'll yeah. win them for you.
Well, that being said, I think Kibler has some decent matchups going into the next few matches. He mm -hmm. probably has like the freeze mage from Firebat, although like I wouldn't put it past Firebat to just switch it up yet again to either Tempo or Mech Mage. And he has the Hunter, which is like kind of 50-50, although a lot of people would argue for the uh, the Hunter. And then you have the Rogue, which but just according to stats is favored towards the Druid. All right. Well, it's it's one of those things where initially a lot of people were saying, you know, Druid wins, and people said, well, Rogue isn't that bad either. And then it got turned back to where it was initially, where people started saying, well, yeah, you know, Druid does have the edge there because they're the ones putting the pressure on. So unless the, the Rogue gets a crazy Violet Teacher board, it's pretty hard for uh, for her to establish, you know, any threats, really. Yeah. Well, Druid versus Rogue is kind of similar to Druid versus Patron in that, like, stats show that it's favored towards Druid. But all the specialists like would tell you that it's favored towards like the specialist class. Yeah, I mean there is a little bit of merit to that. I know certain pro players, a lot of pro players. You know, you have to kind of be confident in your ability. You have to be like, it. The math lies. I'm just better. Yeah, I mean, exactly. That's basically what they're saying. Like, I know that Sixo specifically probably thinks he's favored in both of those matchups. And if you bring up the stats to him, he'll be like, "Yeah, but that considers everyone." Like. Yeah, I'm, I'm like, better than everyone. <laughs> my my microcosm is different. It reminds me of a bit of Kit Kats, you know, but back when we used to play Control Warrior, he basically said my deck has like a sixty percent win rate against the entire field. Like it doesn't matter who like, I'm going to be playing against, I win about sixty percent of the time. So overall, uh, the deck, you know, Control Warrior is just the best. Um, and if you gave Control Warrior to another player, then he wouldn't perform nearly as well. So that then the statistics were in fact a little skewed. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah. I mean, you have to keep it in perspective. I actually asked Six, so what matchup is um, Patron Warrior unfavored against? And he had to think about it for a while. And then he told me maybe Echo Mage, but that's it. He he does think it's favored against Handlock, which is I still disagree Funny. with. Right. Right. Like, it, it pretty obviously looks to not be favored against Handlock. <laughs> Handlock has that's a very right. strong win percentage. And. I mean, if you face a player as strong as yourself, I feel like you can't really put yourself at that much of an edge, especially to the point where you're like, no, I don't care what the stats say. Never tell me the odds. Yeah, yeah I'm, it's, I, you're right. I, I think 6-0 is like willing to like pretty much like money match anyone in like a best of 11 <laughs> or whatever in that matchup, which yeah. everyone says is unfavored. No, so 6 says he would best of... He would play me 25 times Agro Paladin against Warrior, Patron Warrior, and if I won six, I, I would win the money. So he, would he thinks he would go... Or? Yeah, he thinks he could go 20 and 5, at worst, against Agro Paladin. That makes no sense. I don't believe that at all. Yeah, this is so I'm, insane. We, we're gonna do that someday. We're gonna do make it, that Do it, do it, Shaggy. Report, report back with the results. Uh, we can even try to make a show match of it online. I mean, you only have, like, two weeks, right, to do it before the new oh, yeah, comes yeah. out? Well, we can always play with the only the old list. Like, yeah. you don't have to be the meta unless wow, something gets that, nerfed. that is so poetic. I'm gonna I'm gonna note that down. You don't <laughs> have to be the meta. You know, this is so good. This Try is gonna live. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so onwards to the next game very soon. Zelay versus Trump. We've got uh, Hunter from Zelay versus Trump's Warriors. So Zelay's looking to lock down the second game in a row to make sure that all his decks are covered. I mean, he did just win with his good patron warrior. Um, so we'll see if he can get another game right away against the control warrior from Trump. Yeah, it's not really what you'd be looking for. I mean, he could be running more of a late game hunter. I believe they actually have run a more mid rangey hunter every time. So. That's pretty fine against Warrior, maybe even favored, but if he is running that aggressive Warrior, or the aggressive Hunter, rather, uh, Control Warrior, not really what you want to match up into. Yeah. Well, the funny thing is that, like, just based on the stats, it actually paints a different picture if you look at the cold hard numbers. Uh, according to the stats... Cold the hard numbers, all right. Cold hard numbers. Okay, right, give, right. It, give it to let's, us. Let's, let's start it up. So Control Warrior is, is 14 and 12 against Space Hunter, which is, like, a lot more even than you expect. It's like 53%. And against all other types of Hunter, mid-range and hybrid, it's around 62%. So now, it's like... Now, yeah. Monk, we talked about skewing stats. I would say I skew that face hunter stat a bit because I'm so good. All right. All right, Chucky. <laughs> but I, I, oh, I, I think, uh, like, 
what to take from it is whoa whoa let's all interrupt what we were doing public announcement here there's a snipe detected in zelle's sniperino <laughs> okay so this card has been used by both zelle and purple drink in the uh hearthstone pro league by pvp live and basically what they're trying to do is like in that format you can basically snipe people or like snipe like snipe people <laughs> in the sense that like you can put specific cards in your deck to counter what you expect your opponents to bring. And both mm -hmm. of these players, they brought it against Sho, who they expected to play, uh, they expected Sho to bring Patron Warrior and Midrange or Hybrid Hunter. So this seems to be a tech against specifically those classes. And because Trump is not bringing Patron and instead he's bringing Control, it's probably not as good of a card. Yeah, you know, that makes a lot of sense. And interestingly enough, you know, it's one of those cards that even against Rogue does fairly okay, because you kill the three threes, you kill the Azure Drakes, and you take them by surprise. Uh, and even if you lower the Violet Teacher down to one, that's a really easy Night Dragon Unleash coming up a little later. So there's a lot of merit to that card, uh, even though it's, you know, obviously not one of the top played secrets in Hunter. So do you guys think Trump's going to play around Snipe this game? I think we'll see a very interesting reaction from Trump. When <laughs> there is a, I mean, it's pretty likely to hit like a shredder, but I mean, it's really not that amazing against Control Warrior. You said, you know, it's mostly for Patron Warrior. So the trap he got here was not Snipe. You know, this other one's lighting green, so we know that yeah, for a fact. Probably freezing, yeah. which is much more expected. Now, the the other thing, though, is he might only have those two traps in his deck, so playing this Mad Scientist, uh, the second one, maybe not too good. Yeah, but you want to play it for the body, but really not so much. The alternative, I guess, is just playing a snipe on the field. You just snipe him. Snipe What's the Acolyte. What's he going to do? Yeah, snipe the Acolyte of Pain. That's what you Pew -pew. do here. It would probably hit a Cruel Taskmaster. Uh, Trump could just... What he's thinking is like, okay, I'll, I'll take the freezing trap with my with my cruel task. Oh no, he's not gonna play it. So he will fall victim to snipe. But what if Millhouse Storm comes out? Then that's a good value. So can Trump make any reads off the fact that uh, a secret was played and then Mad Sciences was played? Yeah, you pretty Snake, much assume yeah. it's it's yeah. You can assume Snake, and you can also assume, okay, he only has two secrets in his deck. So, mm. yeah, there is there is some world where Trump doesn't attack into this mad scientist. And there's another world where before he does, he plays Pilot Shredder, gets sniped, he kills the scientist, and a second snipe gets pulled out of the deck. Oh, what a world that would be. Oh, man. I want to live in that world. Just wait for the lock and load, Hunter. <laughs> it's happening. <laughs> <laughs> Double snipe. Hey, meta. Well, you don't have to be meta. <laughs> Thank you, Noxious. <laughs> Today for I their, learned. For the reminder. <laughs> but it's a good quote, though. It's amazing. It's like, can we get, can we get like Shia LaBeouf on a green screen saying that? And Trump. Whoa. Oh, there it is. There's oh, the reaction. Oh, <laughs> oh man. Oh, There's whoa. The what a pickup. Well, not that actually was. that great. He's, oh, uh, he was so distraught because if he had seen... What he did was he played the and Shredder turn, and hit yeah. in turn. If he saw the Snipe, I think he would have hit the, the minion with his axe to protect right. his 3-2. All day, every day, of course. Yeah, so. when this when this happened to show in the uh, PvP live, he, like, I believe he, he like, a, a charger dropped out of the, uh, the Shredder and he just, like, forgot to charge with it, basically, because he hit yeah. end turn right after he played the minion. Yeah, like everybody does. So this is proof that even when you discount a card, it might just crop up in a deck or another. Well, Especially in a card like Snipe, which isn't really like that polarized value-wise. It's not. It's not Wisp, right? Like it's not completely yeah. horrible. It's halfway to viability. I don't know if you guys have played against Snipe, but the animation is obnoxiously like long. You have right. to wait like four seconds after you play your minion for it to finally be like. By the way, get sniped. Yeah. Well, it's kind of like Patron. I actually rage quit against Patron sometimes. I'm like, Alt F4. I know I'm dead. I won't, I don't want to go through this. Oh, this is a bad hand from, right. from Trump. <laughs> Which hand? <laughs> oh, this hand. That, oh, that one with go. all of the top end. Oh, well, he was hoping that dropped a, a one health minion. 
Unfortunately, that's not the case. And actually, the the hunters get like he gets to get the initiative here. So, mm -hmm. well, he has the initiative, one. but it, this seems to be more of a a defensive hunter with a sludge pelcher. So it's not necessarily as good as if he had like a Lotheb on this turn, for instance. Yeah, you'd rather have a more aggressive minion when you're this far ahead. Yeah, you're not capitalizing enough on the fact that you get to dictate what get what gets played and when. So, although. I, most lists these days, they don't have Sludge Belchers, so it's definitely a conscious choice to put that card in. Um, it may have to do something with the fact that Purple Drank did really well with a Sludge Belcher based mid range hunter back in the day, like two months ago. Mm -hmm. It was very popular, I think. Belcher was, I almost want to say, it almost became a staple to the point where you couldn't see a hunter deck without Sludge Belcher for a while, and somehow it just phased out. I don't really like this kill command too much. I mean, he has the freezing trap out. Uh, freezing a shield man is not the greatest thing, but you're pushing so much damage that I think I would have liked to just save that five damage kill command. But you're preventing, you're kind of dealing five by not allowing him to replay shield maiden, right? Yeah, but it costs eight to replay shield maiden. It's such a, a hard Temple card off, to really yeah. fit in. I have no time for games. Well. If Shieldman had actually procced the Freezing Trap, I think uh, Trump might have been in a worse position here. Because now, even though he has Sylvanas on board... like He would almost be dead, if not dead. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. Although, yeah, you're actually right. You're totally yeah, right. It, there's, if he a, did, like, just hero power, he could actually maybe have lethal. He wouldn't with the, the Misha roll, but... Yeah. But the question is, uh, is Alay afraid of Brawl at this point? And can you play around Brawl? No, you can't play around Brawl at all. Um, you're, you're never trading into this Sylvanas. You're never kill commanding it. Maybe you hold back on the Houndmaster uh, and just hero power because you're already setting up for lethal so much next turn anyway. Uh, that's the only thing I could possibly see him doing is just not is just hero powering over playing a minion. I'll see what he does. It looks like he's just going to push phase. Obviously, trading makes no sense when you've got a freezing trap set up. So weave in a little bit more damage with the hero power and see if he can set up for lethal. I think if Trump doesn't pick up the brawl, that's just over. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't see anything he can do here. Is he dead to board? He could kill off the Misha. So then there would be 10, 12, yep, that would be it. So. What is insane is to think that if the Mad Scientist had died, not summoned the second Freezing Trap, and the 3-2 had lived, he would have triggered the Freezing Trap, not putting him in an awkward spot as bad as this one. Well, the, no, this is the first Freezing Trap still. Those yeah, exactly. Didn't grab anything. Yeah. Well, exactly, if, uh, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, is. basically, if Trump had seen the snipe yeah, 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 yeah. and then attacked into that scientist, it could have been a completely <laughs> different game. Oh, man, like, snipe, did Snipe win the game? Can we say, can we agree that Snipe won the game? Snipe I, I bamboozled Trump. Okay, Snipe Bamboozled Trump. That's good. That's good enough. It seems like in Archon League, it, like every single week, Trump has had some crazy thing happen to him and he's reacted. Like, yeah. He, he, had the, he had the turn against Life Coach. Against me, he attacked a 9 3 Frothing Berserker into a, fr into a freezing trap, like thinking right. it was explosive. And then he was just like so taken aback, and then I won the next turn. Uh, here he got sniped. Like. <laughs> Bad things happen to Trump in this league, man. That one week he went like one and oh, four. six. No, oh four. Yeah, yeah one and six. You're right, exactly. And it was yeah. it was uh, like yeah, it was like one and six. I think it was like one and five actually. I think no, he lost. Two else. He lost every single game oh. because his teammates both went two and zero. Okay, and then yeah. he lost all of his games with mid range paladin. Pretty much, he lost two games with Patriot. He did not win with that. Yeah, he did yeah. not win with mid range paladin. Well, that was uh, pretty unlucky for Trump there. I mean, if uh, now, the, again, you know, we spoke about this earlier, but the surprise factor um, in this league, when you seal, you bring a deck that's kind of different from the usual archetypes that are expected, and you seal the game with it. You don't have to, you know, try to push it and force it. In the case of Trump, you know, bringing Control Warrior, although it's not completely out of this world as far as bringing an, an archetype to a tournament, it's still somewhat unexpected. And now he, his opponents are playing with that knowledge. Um, yeah. I think the Control Warrior right now would be pretty okay to line up. I think I, it would be something to play, maybe. I, yeah. I, I don't think it's a bad choice to bring Control Warrior, actually. like It lines mm -hmm. up against uh, Freeze Mage and Rogue and uh, Patron Warrior, p p possibly, which are three decks you know, you pretty much know your opponents are going to bring based on what they've brought before. 
Um, and you've also know that uh, Archon, like, they don't tend to bring Druid every single time. So that's yet another matchup that's, uh, like, that's good for the Druid, but it's thrown out the window. Yeah. Well, guys, if you uh, want to comment on anything that's been happening so far, you can do so by tweeting hashtag ATLC, followed by your comment, of course, if you want to congratulate, uh, you know, Kibler on his performance. Sadly, ending the winning streak, but he's still doing pretty well here. He's got one more win to grab with his Druid before he can say that his day's done. But, I mean, this could be difficult either way. I mean, there's four decks left for Value Town to push through, and Freeze Mage and Rogue are usually going to be able to pull off at least one of those, right? Like, pick off at least one of those each. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, like Monk said, the Control Warrior lines up really well into these last mm -hmm. two decks. The Druid has a 50-50 shot of hitting Freeze Mage, and Rogue's not too bad either. Uh, Rogue, I guess, kind of ha you really want to get the Mirror Match if you're Dog. And uh, maybe Trump's Warlock deck could end up being the weak link here. Regardless, uh, Value Town has a lot of ground to cover with two their two wins down, but... Yeah, it's a yeah. bit uh, it's a bit complicated. So we see that Mage from Fire oh, Bash, obviously, versus the Control Warrior. So basically, guys, this is a case of Firebat often just escape conceding sometime in the mid game. <laughs> he does now, that a lot, you know, I right? I don't know if he'll do that here because okay. you do you do have teammates that you, if your teammates right. don't want you to, you kind of have you're obliged to play it out, right? Yeah. Right, of course, of course. Well. I, I've seen Firebat also concede on turn one when queuing up this matchup. Well, it, he kind of just like looks at his opening hand and he's like, okay, Emperor's not there, Archmage isn't there. Uh, you <laughs> yeah, got I've seen me. Yeah, he do that a lot. It's, uh, um, he could yeah. be a different mage. I mean, there's small chance. I think okay. Freeze Mage is incredibly good in this format, though, so... And yeah, it's Freeze Mage. But, uh, there is a chance. This matchup has gotten significantly better uh, since Emperor Thorson came out Right. Uh, for the Freeze Mage. It's not. It's no longer like 90-10, 95-5. It's, it's more like a 20% chance for the Freeze Mage. And the big keys are getting a really nice Emperor into a really nice Archmage Antonitis. And for the Warrior, you can no longer sit back and armor up forever because there is a, a theoretical infinite damage possibility. Um... So you do have to present some threats, which isn't a big deal for a control warrior to do. They play a lot yeah. of threats. And they have time to establish them too, which is, I think, what the biggest upside is, is they don't have to rush into playing those threats, because the Freeze Mage is not going to burst them down anytime soon. So well, they can just wait, find those 8 drops, 9 drops, back to back. Yeah, oh, well, yeah. Go ahead. Well, like uh, like Chalky said, it's pretty much a, an 80-20 matchup. The stats say it's 12-3. But I believe uh, like most of those Freeze Mage wins came from Sea Story Cup when Blackrock Mountain was first released. Remember the infamous uh, Ignite versus Amaz game, where <laughs> Amaz just like ran out of cards as the control right. warrior and he just lost because he couldn't deal with like Alex Straws and Archmage Antonidas. Yeah, one big thing actually is um, if there is just no execute and no shield slam, there is a chance you actually stick a, a threat and win the game off that. Yeah, because they don't remove the 8-8 eight eight and suddenly you're able to get one attack and remove the you know bulk of armor and suddenly you can actually get it done. Yeah. I don't think that's going to be a problem in this game just because Trump, he has the Trump has so much cycle, yeah. Yeah. Armor made to fit. <laughs> Playing I was hoping for Marin to be here. Well, he did kind of throw out the armor smith a little early. Now, you don't have as many whirlwind effects to abuse it as a control warrior, but it is still one of those things where he's not going to get near as much armor out of it as he could. Yeah. Well, actually, Firebat got pretty much like one of the best hands you could have gotten. He had like the loot hoarder, the mad scientist, and now an acolyte. You can't much ask for too much more except maybe an emperor here. Yeah. If he drew in these next two draws, like Emperor and Archmage, that'd be pretty well set up to just go for it. That's pretty unlikely, but... Oh, he does have more draw. I mean, an Arcane Middle Egg could also help quite a bit. Yeah, he's not under much threat, which is nice. Like, unless Trump starts developing, like, Ragnaros, Doctor Boom, maybe even just Shield Maidens in the upcoming turns, then... He actually hasn't gained much armor, he hasn't put out much threat, and like Monk said, he's cycled a lot. So, 
Well, You're Fairbrad, looking okay. Fairbrad Not goes good. and removes the Armorsmith right away instead of keeping it for potential, you know, as you mentioned earlier, an Archmage Antonidas turn. Yeah, well, here's the most, uh, the first, like, really interesting card in the game, and that's actually the second loot hoarder. Um, these days, like, you pretty much, like, 90% of people only play one loot hoarder, and the second loot hoarder is, like, cut for something like the anti kill bot or the, um, or maybe, like, sometimes even a Kona Cold, sometimes even Malagos. So, if he's running two loot hoarders, I feel like that's probably good for this matchup because he wants to cycle mm -hmm. more. But it's also less of a chance that he has Malagos, Malagos, which could help him in this matchup. Yeah, and he has Pyroblast, so I'd say yeah. that's like all of your flex spots locked up. The Pyroblast, the second loot hoarder. I wouldn't be surprised to just see no heal bot from him um, uh, at this point. If you didn't expect any matchup where you'd need it, which I'd almost say, like, if you look at Value Town's past performances, you'd think you don't really need it that much. So I could understand why he's not running it. Yeah, and uh, let's say uh, Trump wins this. Oh, Monk went MIA again. Well, can we try to finish what he said? Oh, Ragnaros well, gets picked they, up. Yeah, That's a sick card against... Uh, no no second flame strike, for example. In future games. Okay, so I, I we didn't quite hear what you said. You kind of lagged out there for a second, Monk. Would you, would oh, you care to say that again? Yeah, I was, I was going to say that um, because we've seen the second loot hoarder and the Pyroblast, if Firebat wins this game, or rather, if Trump wins this game in like the first 15 turns or so, now Team Value Town knows that you probably don't have to play around a Malagos or a Flame Strike, or the second Flame Strike, rather. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, a good point. I'd be less likely to play around uh, Healbot as well now. One thing is, Firebat probably won't really get to a point if he loses this game where he'll even play Pyroblast. Yeah, I mean, there's Grom and Cruel Taz. The rag is set up, so, you know, good luck removing that in any yeah. meaningful way. Here starts the pressure, and without, like, uh, Blood Mage Fireball Ping, there really isn't an efficient way in the Freeze Mage deck to remove Ragnaros. This is one of those, like, situations where you can imagine Firebat saying, I've literally never won in this position before. Yeah, <laughs> escape conceit. Yeah. Well, again, I think maybe the main reason he isn't conceding is you do have a team relying on you, so it's... Of course. You want to make it. sure you're not throwing any chance away. Uh, he's, I think he's the only player that I've seen do it as much as he has, though. Like, it's one of the traits that almost defines him as a player. He just looks at the board state, he's like, there's no way I'm coming back from this. I don't want to go through the motions. I am out. See you guys later. To be fair, I think looking at the hands now... Uh, it's it's in a pretty bad spot. Uh, Trump has a lot of the armor gain to make sure he doesn't get burned out, which, I mean, Firebat doesn't even have the burn charge at the moment, but it, past that, he has the Gromish Taskmaster, even double Taskmaster, to make sure he has enough damage to pop the block pretty soon. And it, it's going to get rough. got the shield maiden, the shield block. I mean, his, he his effective health is in the 50s if he really decides to go for it. And his uh, Emperor survived. <laughs> So Yeah, <laughs> you know, why not? A little bit of a cheaper deal on that sludge belcher. And, and he has the, the shield slam to kind of cover his bases, make sure he can remove the Alex, make sure he can remove the, the Antoninus. It's, it's pretty much uh, just kind of Trump playing out his cards in the right order from this point on, and we'll have to see if Firebat sees those cards and decides to concede, but... Yeah, well, Firebat might be thinking he's taking a long time, so you might actually not have like the greatest hand, but this is probably the greatest hand. Trump's, Trump actually <laughs> has the greatest hand. Yeah, yeah there's no like, way this is not winning the game. He's going to gain 12 armor this turn and reduce another 8 cards. I, I can't always tell what Firebat's thinking is the worst part. It's like, he doesn't really give too much away. I can always get there's like a, a sense of boredom and he's gonna go for Archmage this turn and oh um, I guess not I would have liked to see him just Archmage Frost Nova and say okay I'm conceding if you have Shield Slam <laughs> okay he's gonna do it next turn he's gonna do it next turn so oh this might bait out yeah yeah exactly well never mind that does it uh, okay even if he yeah. just uses the Shield Slam here maybe like Trump is thinking. Like he can, like he has to save the shield slam and the execute in order to deal with back to back Alexstrasza and Archmage Antonidas. 
Trump does not want to lose this game, that's for sure. <laughs> That well, would it's be one of the good lineups, though, for him. Like, what's really cool about this is that for Trump, from Trump's perspective, running into Rogue isn't that bad, but running into Freeze Mage is a dream. So that's going to allow him to log down that uh, Control Warrior. Yeah. Well, this is definitely one of the reasons you'd bring Control Warrior. Uh, Patron Warrior is still really good against it, but it is, I would say, slightly worse against uh, Freeze Mage. I think it's harder because unless you're running a list that runs, you know, double shield block, uh, it's yeah. a little tougher to stack yeah. that extra bit of armor that sometimes gets you past the point of no return. Yeah, yeah I and, think and the biggest fair, deal. Go ahead. Yeah, I was gonna say I don't even think double shield block is like that amazing in um, Patron Warrior against Freeze Mage, simply because like you go to fatigue so much and the extra cycling sometimes doesn't actually help. Whereas in Control Warrior, you almost never go to fatigue with shield blocks. Yeah, the biggest deal, I think, is uh, cards like Shield Maiden, which give you extra health and present a threat and don't cycle you. And also the fact that Control Warrior plays uh, much better threats. Like, Dr. Boom and Ragnaros do a much better job of pressuring your opponent than uh, just War Song Commander, Patron. Stuff that just gets removed by Flame Strike, by Blizzard, like... You don't have as much ways to pressure them, whereas like this game we saw Trump just coined out Ragnaros. That did 16 and forced Firebat to fireball it. So here, here's an interest, interesting spot. Trump used the Execute the previous turn, and now he might be uh, baited into using the Shield Slam. So that actually gives um, Archmage Antonis, like some opportunity to deal with some Yeah, blood. but he's out of Frost Omens now. Uh, he has one left, right? No, he used both. He used he just went back to back frost over Doomsayer. Okay. Is the hand delayed here that we're seeing? Uh Oh yeah, I... he used Blizzard. Okay. You're right, he did use Blizzard. Never mind. Okay. My bad. Yeah, Shocky, so, what's up with that? So, I mean, <laughs> there's gonna be a brawl. He does have Sylvanas Brawl to hedge his bets, so Okay, yeah. so in the in the game that Amaz lost to Ignite in the in Sea Story Cup. Amaz actually had to lose a brawl where Archmage and yeah, yeah. survived. Well, so, there's a Sylvanas though, so yeah, that it's will a, change. It's impossible. The... Yeah. <laughs> and, and the other thing is, uh, Firebat just hovered over his cards. Five left. Uh, I yeah. don't think he has time. What to do? Like even if even if he got the fireballs, um, Trump can set him to one at any time now with the Grom Taskmaster combo. And then as soon as he hits fatigue, he's dead. That's right. Assuming he has no heal bot in his deck. And, and he doesn't even have uh, enough burn, I don't think, to end this game. Like, Trump's going to kill this Archmage. He can do it in any way he wants. He's got the Grom. He's got the Task. Uh, he has Sylvanas Brawl. He has an he Execute. execute. <laughs> like, yeah, I, I mean, at this point, I wouldn't be surprised to see a Concede. Well, as you said, you know, he's going to be playing for his team, so he's going to stick it until the end. But it's just one of those situations where going into the matchup, you already have apprehensions because you know it's just so horrible. And it's not as though Firebat is a newcomer either way. You know, he's seen his fair share of that specific matchup. He used to be one of the most common for a while, like at high-level metagames before, you know, before the metagame shifted away from Nax. Like, you could see a lot of those. Even before Nax Ramus, it was seen a bit. Um, and it would just go on and on forever. So he's seen both Doomsayers, so there's really not a risk of a, a Doomsayer wiping this board and making a miracle comeback happen. Yeah, like... I think even without the Execute, this play would be okay. Because yeah, you, again... How do you with, get OTK'd, right? With 50-something health, like... You can't lose within three turns. The only way you lose is if you are if you don't have Execute, if the opponent has literally, you know, two Sorcerer Apprentice and a discounted Echo of Medivh. Mm -hmm. One of the Sorcerer's Apprentices, you know, was uh, discounted, and then you just play Infinite Fireball. But that's not happening in Freeze Mage. Ever. Yep, so. Not even close to what Firebat needed to pull out that matchup. Yep, not at all. Well, it's uh, he still has pretty okay matchups going forward. Uh, it's far from done for him. It's not as though Freeze Mage is a dead, uh, you know, dead deck. If only because Trump might be playing Handlock, it's still not bad over there. Yeah. Well, the issue is, uh, I think if you know your opponents are going to be playing Freeze Mage, I've seen a lot of lists in Archon League. They add in Lothebs and Ragnaroses like almost like yeah. randomly, and it's because they want to counter that Freeze Mage. And Lotheb, like, not only is Lotheb good against Freeze Mage, 
it's good against Rogue, which is also in a lot of Archon League, um, uh, Archon League lineups. Lineups, yeah. You, where, you bring up where, a like, point. Where you wouldn't put Lotheb as much in a standard, like, best of five conquest format, for example. Mm -hmm. Lotheb's actually really powerful against Patron Warrior as well. It almost always gets in its damage. So, like, in, in my Hunter list and in a lot of other Hunter list people are, are making nowadays... Uh, Lothab's just included, basically, regardless of what Hunter variant you run. Yeah, well, I, I remember initially when uh, people use like, when the patron got developed, people didn't really think Lothab was good against it, but it prevents so many, you know, mid-game draw. You know, they start cycling about two, three, four cards sometimes at that point of the game, and you just get a body on the board that's going to stick, and they have to answer it over two turns, which gives you back the initiative. So it's a really big swing card uh, in and of itself, if only because it slows down the war from drawing his deck. Well, looks like we've got Rogue on either side. Yeah, it's... I mean, Freeze Mage is very strong, but it is kind of in a position now where it doesn't have amazing matchups. If Trump is Handlock, uh, as he usually is, Handlock and Druid do pretty fine. Rogue's obviously fine for Firebat to face. Uh, and like you said, the Rogue's is pretty much just a toss-up as far as Who's really gets a win in first? Mm -hmm. I would say Sixos is better positioned uh, because he has three okay matchups, whereas Dog has a 50 50 chance of hitting Freeze Mage. Yeah, Kibler has okay. Like the, the Druid from Kibler lines up pretty well against uh, both the Mage and the Rogue, so he's not quite out of it. If he wants to be throwing himself here, I think uh, that, that would be a good time now because both the decks that are left could give you a win. And if you're playing for those tiebreakers, it might be a good opportunity. Yeah. Another yeah. thing to consider is if Firebat loses twice, then he's locked out. So then you know your next match is going to be against Sixo. So that's something that Archon might be considering as well. Mm -hmm. Well, knowing that they might play around the bench, what would you queue into Rogue? I mean, obviously not the Rogue for a 50 50, unless the other two matchups are poorly favored. Would you play Handlock or Druid into the Rogue? Well, uh, I think the bench doesn't matter at all once you're down to two decks. Um, yeah. In theory, it does, if you think about it, like, okay, if Firebat loses this, he's benched. But if if you think about the other scenario where he doesn't play this match, then he's technically benched as well. So it's a 50-50 either way, like, whether they play Major Rogue. So, just kind of like a coin flip scenario. Uh, like you said, I think from Value Town's point of view, they are mostly going for tiebreakers. Uh, your match differential does matter, especially with the league being as close as it is. There's tons of two and two teams where teams are separated by a game or two differential. Yeah, it's a tiny margin which doesn't amount. Like it might amount to a little bit once we're done, but with the first phase, you know, the first seven teams moving on uh, means that you have a little bit of leeway. Yeah, and this is going to be a huge matchup for uh, for Trump here. Really needs to pick up a win against this Freeze Mage, or else uh, Kibler's chances of winning with Druid go down significantly, and the odds of Value Town to be able to pick up three in a row, pretty low. Yeah, no, it's the, also a very tough matchup sometimes for the, the Warlock player. The interesting thing is that even though Archon might win this match, if Kibler just doesn't play for the rest of the match, he's gonna still have like a 9-1 record. Yeah. You, you do right. have to, uh... <laughs> now... Well. It is interesting. I think the team tiebreakers are, are more important than the Master of Duels kind of, like, going for that. So if they did value Druid as, like, their best choice, I think they'd still go with it. Plus, there's always the chance he just wins and goes to 10-1. and one. But uh, it, you do have to, to be the Master of Duels, your team has to advance to the live final. So you have to be in the top four teams of the league. So, is this a turn? I mean, I guess you, you have the options here, you know, with the Mountain, Twilight. Mountain, you assume, is going to die. If anything, you're kind of throwing it out there if there's a Fireball. Um, but you can still have decent follow-up pressure with the Double Drake. I think there's merit here for, for Firebat to not remove it and just keep going face. And uh, bring his opponent down? Okay. Yeah, there's. it's a really dangerous game as the Handlock when your opponent gets to chip you down to around 15 health without even needing to Alex you mm -hmm. just because they got the early minions. And there's that point where it's like, okay, I'm at 15. Am I dead? Do I need to heal bot? You heal bot, and then they Alex you, and you're like, maybe I shouldn't have heal botted. Like, I, I don't know. It's, it's a point where like Firebat's forcing Trump to do something, and he's sitting pretty at 30. So, 
I really like that point you brought up because it forces the the handlock player to use his heal bot early in fear of the you know frostbolt ice lands ice lands that might come out mm -hmm. of nowhere, and then the Alex hits. So you're kind of making your opponent make a mistake basically. Yep. I kind of like it. It's like a uh, feels more like a chess move than anything else. If you're afraid of these minions, like, and you want to hellfire them, that puts you down to 16, yeah. and it gives your opponent so many cards. An alternative would be to something like. Uh, Ancient Watcher into Sun Fury Protector, and that's that, but that feels a little too defensive. So Trump is going to respond with aggression as well. This is like, like you said, it's almost like chess. You just, you don't want to make the first defensive move. You just really want to keep pressuring and force your opponent to be the first person to kind of falter and go mm -hmm. for something defensive. So, yep, it's going to be more pressure from Firebat. It's down to 15, and that is one of those health values where the, as Firebat gets to higher mana totals, uh, Trump has to be afraid. Like, he yeah. could die. And so I wouldn't be surprised to see Healbot very soon, as you mentioned, right? Like, as a result of the, the amount of damage that's been dealt, like, 15 is kind of a, a tipping point when you're playing against Freeze Mage, because you know that, you know, double Fireball, Frostbolt kills you over a few turns. Frostbolt, Frostbolt, Ice Lance, plus a little fo uh, follow-up Frostbolt will also kill you. It's really dangerous. So he's finally going to taunt up to stop these minions from getting chip and damage. So it's like a mix of an aggressive and a defensive play. He still is at 15, so he has to be a little afraid. But now it's at a point where, uh, because Trump has been so aggressive, now uh, Firebat feels bad about Impering here. Like, can you really Emperor? I mean, you're staring down 18, so you'd have to, at the very least, trade in your scientist to get a secret. But if you trade everything in, then at least you're getting two extra cards for the Emperor, so you could find lethal off of it. I think it ultimately depends on what secret comes out. Um, yes. But it could still be fine to go for the, the Scientist either way. Because, uh, yeah, I mean, even if, if it's Ice Barrier, it's still fine. Oh, it's Ice Block. That's even better for him. Yeah, he's got the double Ice Block lined up, so he could start going for a very aggressive, like you said, trade in both Act Lights, get the Emperor off, and just do it. But the, the Blizzard is really safe here. Uh, it does make sure that that ice block lives at least another turn. So it's acting as another ice block, basically. Yeah. So, gonna stall. He he has two guaranteed lives, so he's going to get to fire off burn at one point. Then his block gets popped. Then he gets to put, play another block, fire off some more burn. It gets popped again. So he gets three waves of being able to try and kill Trump. And Trump has to respond to that with cards like Lothab and Healbot. Yeah. And hope it, it's enough. And interestingly enough, what this also does, it lets uh, Firebat draw more cards to enable a possible better Emperor for even more, you know, one turn burst. So there's the early heal bot. Uh, that does take away Trump's ability to heal now, and he, he did tap that turn. So, still took a tiny bit of damage. We have to see though if Firebat picks up another freeze. That that might just be enough to. Oh, oh wow! He does. Wow! That's, now that's there perfect. is there, there is an owl. There is a shadow flame. Uh, Firebat has to expect one of those is there, so I doubt he'll go for the Doomsayer. That feels a little too optimistic. Uh, although if you do play it um, and you get either of those out, you still have the board frozen, so you're buying yourself a bit more time to find perhaps another freeze to then drop Emperor, get that double or triple wave of burn as you mentioned earlier. Yeah, yeah but and there's the, the Alex. The, the yeah. opportunity cost is uh, the two cards that you get from the Arcane Intellect, though, so it doesn't feel like yeah. that's a risk you want to, that's worth taking. Yeah, I think it was really smart of uh, Firebat to not go for the Doomsayer. It's it's a greedy play you could see and be like, well, if it goes off, I win the game. But the odds it goes off are probably lower than the odds of winning the game if you just go for the draws. Playing more cards to enable the Emperor, yeah. So, Trump doesn't really have a way to fetch more cards to look for a second heal bot without life tapping. Uh, so, I mean, he, he wants to generally posture himself in a way to... At this point, you know, it's almost like Firebat's playing Solitaire and Trump's kind of sweating it out, like, will he kill me? <laughs> like, oh, Trump has to... Oh, rogue, basically. Yeah, yeah, he can... Like, Trump's kind of thinking, okay, I could Owl to deny him one card, uh, or multiple cards even, potentially. I could Owl to push face damage, but I can't really pop him, so does that matter? I could put down Emperor. It doesn't really do much. It reduces some nice cards, I guess. 
and he has to think about like owling stuff. Does he dark bomb stuff? So it yeah. looks like he's gonna go for the eight damage, which is surprising to me because this doesn't really change the clock. Yeah, um, it doesn't accelerate it by much because if your board is gonna die, it's gonna uh -oh. die no matter what. Yeah, and I mean, he does have the Shadow Flame to protect him from the, the Frost Nova Doomsayer. So again, it'd be really heads up a Firebat to s even seeing that Owl not go for uh, a Doomsayer play here. And just go for Emperor straight up? Yeah, j well, just go for like, he could draw more cards, Frost Nova again, and um, try to keep drawing into more burn. And as soon as he gets more burn, with the second Ice Block in hand, like next turn he can Alex him. And then maybe just burn him out, and there's more burning. So yeah, yeah. I really kind of have to question the last owl play from Trump. Like as you said, Chalky, it doesn't really change the clock. The like you have nine damage in your hand, but your opponent is at ten health. And even if you use that nine damage, like one of them is still a health fire, which damage is used for three. Whereas if you use the owl on the acolyte of pain, like he would be denying two draws essentially. Yeah. So the main the main thing here, Firebat's changing his play, right? So he's going for the Doomsayer, which you could look at and say, but, you know, he just didn't go for it last turn. I don't think it's because he saw the Owl. I think it's morally because at he didn't have anything else to do. Like, he could draw, but he would overdraw. He could play Blood Mage, but you don't want to just throw that out. He had nothing to play, so you might as well just also throw out this Doomsayer, force out the Shadow Flame. He could choose not to shadow flame the giant, uh, it but it would, so it would cost surprising. him a dark bomb. He could cost him a dark bomb, uh, shadow flaming something else. You know, I kind of like Doctor Boom. If you're playing around board wise at any point, the Boom bots could seal the game, assuming the opponent's not able to mm. heal up. Assuming he whiffs on everything and he Wait, doesn't have lethal, yeah. the Boom bots now, could help later on. If Trump had one more mana, he could go for something crazy like Hellfire Doctor Boom and potentially in the game. Well, the Boom bots, unfortunately, like they can't get yeah. put on the board right he, now because it's full. He can't right get rid now. of his board because he can't. He can't cast Hellfire as well as play Boom. So he's at 19, and Firebat has a lot of damage. He can set him to 15 with Alex. He can play Emperor so that he can get more flexibility with his cards. Right now, I believe he only has maybe like 15, maybe a little more. Yeah, he has 16. Hmm. And there is no heal from Trump. Firebat doesn't know that, but he's already seen the one heal bot. It might be a second one. That's the only thing you're afraid of is that, you know, Trump is going to go back up to 23 health as soon as you bring him down to 15. Yep. But with two yep. turns of Ice Block ahead of you, I mean, the yeah. only thing that could really go down is heal bot into low step. Like, that would be the absolute worst sequence of cards, but even then you might be able to pull it off at the last second by stalling. So he's thinking over this Alex. I mean, I think the only other play would be, like, Arcane Intellect into Emperor. Yeah, uh, to maximize the value of the amount of coins you get, basically. I, I no feel like deal. even even though Firebat's hand is really large, it's like I would say below average for this point in the game. He would definitely want more burn damage in his hand, and at which point he could play Emperor instead of this Alex. This I Alex think he is just wants more flexible burn rather. Like it's like if you have both Ice Lances or if you have the Pyroblast, you could have Pyroed last turn and just gone for it. Yeah, this doesn't feel as good. The uh, the Alex, like you expect this to be dealt with a BGH, right? And it essentially it did three damage. Yeah, it did, it did four. It did four, and but still. four. Yeah, I, I don't even think you have to BGH it if you're Trump. At this point, he's just dead to burn if he doesn't draw that heal bot, and he will end up tapping for it. He didn't get it, and he expects to be dead. I mean, the the only play I could see him yeah. do here is like double trade three three and win five five into Alex. Hope your opponent only has flame strikes to deal with your board, and then he ends up flame striking Doctor Boom and you win. But that's like the only possible way. Yeah, there's uh, there's not much going for him here. I mean, he knows Firebat cycled through so many cards. Yeah, and he's gonna fact, try. He's just dead. Yep. Yep. But those boom bots, man. I hope Firebat doesn't try some funky BM because it's gonna it's gonna burn. Ah. Uh, doesn't look uh, like he's going for that. Going for the exact lethal potentially, maybe a little overkill. Yeah. Well, there's it. There it is. But I mean, Shucky, why would you show the second frostbolt? 
It's too much information. <laughs> it's too much. Yeah, it's too much information in Conquest. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Well, like, <laughs> next next week, your opponents are playing against you. They're like, Ah, do you really think he plays two? <laughs> two frost bolts and freeze mage. That doesn't seem very likely. What well, there's already pick? so much freeze. Like, why do yeah, well, you need two? <laughs> You can yeah. cut Frostbolt, it sounds just about fine. I mean, oh, st Stranger Things have happened. People are cutting <laughs> Fiery War Axe in Warrior. Right. And that's like a card I never expected anyone to cut in Warrior. Mm -hmm. It's after yeah, all this, the Fiery Win Axe. You're right. But I don't know. It's uh, I guess people have started valuing card draw so much in Patron Warrior that they really don't care much about anything else. Like, there have been versions of Patron Warrior that are just inconsistent across the board that run nothing but draw. So, it's been, uh, those have been kind of funny to look at. Now, Xixo is the only one left on Team Archon to have to get a win with his Rogue, and he's up against at least a 50-50 with the Rogue. He's up against a Handlock and the Druid from Kibler. So, we mentioned earlier, you know, Druid might have a bit of an edge there. Uh, Handlock... Some people think Rogue is favored, some people think Warlock's favored, but for the last one it's going to be a coin flip pretty much no matter what. Th this part is actually really interesting to me because now the team has to decide collectively what deck is best against this Rogue, and I, I think uh, like from a Druid perspective, like from Kibler's perspective, he might think that Druid is really favored against Rogue, but Dog being a Rogue specialist, he might <laughs> think that, hey, I'm more favored with just the Mirror against Rogue. So. It's kind of yeah. a lineup of like, like who like who who is the dominant personality on his team? Basically, it's especially yeah. funny because there's all three of them left. Right. So it's like normally yeah. you know it might be two plays that have to talk it out, but in this case it's like a three way discussion of like who not only thinks their deck is favored but that they're favored. They have experience all this stuff, and if you're a Value Town fan, I, I think I've kind of thought about this. The worst thing you could see here is Dog to queue up because that means that they have collectively decided. That their other two decks are unfavored more than yeah, that would match. that would be awful. Although you could say also the dog is such a rogue uh, specialist that they they hedge their bets on him winning the mirror match more often than not. Yeah. So, although this you know this level of play again it comes down to minute differences in the way people play out their decks, and I think the mulligan is where it matters most. And when you have only one game as sample size, it's a little tough sometimes to make uh, a huge distinction. So again, if you guys have any thoughts about the matches coming right up, you can tweet to hashtag ATLC. Any thoughts, uh, feel free to share them. They might show up on screen. Now, what do you think, like from your perspective, what would you queue up as Value Town? Like knowing averages, Monk, you know, and the stats, the cold hard math, what would oh, you queue up? Uh, definitely, definitely Druid. Uh, okay. Druid, okay, just like going by the stats, all, all Rogue Mirror is 50-50. Uh, We're going to ignore that screen for now. It's 50-50. Yeah. All Rogue versus Druid is... 37% and Oil Rogue versus Handlock is 57%. So just going by the stats, I would queue up Druid, Mirror, and then Handlock. All right. Okay. Well, that seems to make sense. I mean, Sixto is playing against uh, Kibler's nothing. I, but uh, we, is it Kibler that's going to be playing here? Because I have to assume it is. That Probably. both players are going to be play, facing off, but the, the name yeah. of the classes has been uh, no. mixed up a bit. This is kind Something. of where the the master of duels and the team tiebreakers collide. Because if you're if you're Kibler, you probably just like if you're gonna lose, you don't want to play. You're like, no, I'll I'll sit on my nine and one record, guys. No thanks. Yes, yeah. <laughs> right. But the, but the team for the for the best of the team, he needs to go first. Yeah. Oh, um, man. Another thing to consider is like the amount of weapon hate is in each player's decks. Not only is six zero playing rogue, he's playing a very weapon based version of rogue that runs. Two uh, that runs the Assassin's Blade and two of the Goblin Auto Barbers. So Weapon Hate is going to be really good against him. I know Trump really prefers one ooze in his deck, and Kibler he's running Druid, so like every Druid list has Harrison Jones in his in the deck. Meanwhile, right. Rogue, um, Dog's Rogue probably doesn't have any anti-weapon stuff, so that's also something to consider. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, Weapon Hate has been prevalent pretty much everywhere uh, for good reason. It takes away a lot of the good. I mean, even against. And I guess the, the feel is so diverse that it's really hard to really pin against which class you're meaning to play that weapon hate. But when you see Shaman come back with their Doom Hammers, uh, Patron's always around. You've got Control Warrior cropping up to beat Patron. You've got Rogue that's just doing somewhat well against the entire field. Uh, it's kind of interesting to see that weapon hate is just overall something you put in against the entire field rather than a specific deck nowadays. Uh, no ramp again oh, for Kibler wow. is the first thing we see. And, well, there's no prep sprint, prep sap, prep eviscerate, prep everything for 6-0 either. 
Well, yeah, prep is going to be pretty big with the hand he has with the two tinkers in the sprint, but double hero power, and he's going to get the initiative, which is pretty big. He can just coin out Violet Teacher. Yeah, and I don't uh, I don't see any other play from him, and he's got the double backstab, the SI, to go with the dagger in case the Shredder comes out, which it undoubtedly will. Kibler's going to have to really come up with... Uh, with it's going to be tough. Yeah. yeah. It's going to be really tough. What if I always say house? getting an early Violet Teacher out with a few tokens is like the best thing you can do against Druid, especially if they don't hit wild growth because they won't be able to like swipe Hero Power or swipe Wrath to deal with this Violet Teacher. Do you think you would you would SI first? I think I'd just take the four. Yeah, it's, I would. It's too. so likely to be a three two, right? What if Millhouse and then you don't have the two damage from oh, the backstab? I guess okay, well. it's gonna oh, be super aggressive. Use both backstabs, but I think I would like to save one with the Azure Drake um, for next turn. I don't know. Swipe uh, would be a, a big help here for Gibbler, who right. picks up nothing but a Savage Roar. Oh man. This has got to feel awful. <laughs> yep. This is kind of how fates change. I mean... This is how... You know, it's funny because we speak of Druid sometimes. It's like you see it in a tournament. You're like, yeah, Druid is dominant. And then you look back <laughs> at the VODs and you realize it's really just... They all got wild growth. They all got <laughs> Innervate. And then you see the same, you know, the same classes Ooh. being played in the future tournament. And it just does nothing. So there's prep. I... I wouldn't be surprised to see him trade in a 1-1 one -one, yeah, instead of using his face just to preserve the dagger now for the, the oils coming up. I, next turn, you could even just see double oil. Uh, oh, man. Well, maybe that, not. Yeah. It, it's not a great Harrison. Yeah, I feel like Thoris is a little better, so. Well, yeah. Thoris and Jones. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel like it's not that great of a Thorazin either. Like, just... Ooh. Judging by the number of cards that are in Kibler's deck, he definitely I feel like he definitely needs a swipe in this case. Yeah, yeah and a sap with the Tinkers, with an auto barber. Yeah. Is is this it? Is this where it all comes crashing down? So many options. I mean, at first I think you'd probably let's see, you'd you'd wanna just you could either prep out the oil. Or you could play Auto Barber first. It really depends. You have to kind of think about the sequencing of where you want the oil to hit. Because yeah. you can prep either oil or sap this turn. Uh, and you still end up with, you know, the same amount of cards being able to be played. Ooh, so, that's painful. That doesn't get swiped ever. Yeah. That's first that's oil hits. I assume the Auto Barber is going to come down as well. And that's a seven minion board on turn six. All hitting face. Well, you know, he's all about that face. Yeah, and I mean... That's... that's almost rough. too much damage. Yeah, it's like... What can you really do? You can try to Harrison... Now. Oh, and well. then draw into nothing, basically. Yeah, I mean... It's a tough turn to think about what even gives you a chance to win. But I feel like if you're going to win, it involves the cards in Sixo's hands not being the cards that they are. Like, uh, Sprint is, is one of those things you can't assume they have, and Oil is probably the most damaging card Sixo could have. Again, even if Kibler had the ideal hand at this point, I don't... Think he could he couldn't even back. cast it, right? Like, how does he yeah. even cast it and then live to the following turn? Even if he had double swipe. If he had double swipe, that would be. Okay. That would save him He'd for survive. now. And yeah. even then, it's still a stretch. So, this is what he's found as far as surviving, I suppose. Will this save him, though? I don't think it does. Yeah, I don't think it does at all. I think he's still dead, dead on board. Dead on board, so. Wow. Kibler's win streak. It's going to end there, and Team Archon is going to be taking this series. Not only did Value Town not get the tiebreaker that we're looking for, but Kibler's score is, uh, you know, creeping slowly towards Hyped or Firebass. Whichever of them is uh, slow, like, close behind him. Yeah, it's not quite there, but if Hyped mm. goes, like, 2-0, oh, he's he's getting there. Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, still, Kibler will retain his lead uh, by the end of this week. He went 9-2, yeah. I believe so far and no right. one can beat that the best is hyped and at best he can do nine three yeah, yeah I mean, he's got we're, seven we're talking, three right now 
Yeah. We're talking like it's so bad that he lost, but he's definitively <laughs> still in first place. Right. He's still very far ahead. I mean, it doesn't take, like we say, it's, you know, it's really not that difficult for a player uh, to lose, you know, f multiple games in a row, like Kibler get a really bad week. But then it's still not, a, it's still the same difficulty of that happening for Hyped. I mean, he might just get a really bad week and then suddenly Kibler's lead is even better than it is now. So mm -hmm. it could happen. It's, uh, it's one of those things. We'll see how it evolves going uh, going in forward. So six to three, pretty good score for Team Archon. I mean, yeah. didn't have a uh, six five as we were talking yeah. about earlier. Definitely actually... one of the more dominating scores. I believe uh, no one's gotten anything above six three. There's been no yeah. six twos, for example. Um, mm -hmm. This also puts Archon ahead of um, Value Town, so gonna push them from third place into first place. I believe Nihilum is still technically in first place unless they lose next match. But yeah, as you can see from the standings. Archon has pushed themselves ahead of Value Town with this win, and this pretty much puts Value Town from having a nice first place lead to kind of back in the pack. Uh, you see, six of the teams have two losses. At the end of this week, there's still going to be a big scramble in the middle for second through sixth place, to second through seventh place rather. Yeah. I mean, as you mentioned earlier, there's really no huge leader, which just goes to show that a lot of the people in this, uh, you know, the entire league so far have been very close in skill, and the teams have been working pretty well together. Even some of the unexpected big winners, you know, Force and Boys, you know, initially you guys just took everyone by a storm, had pretty, you know, bad weeks. The past two weeks were really rough, um, but hopefully you guys this week will be able to come back. And then again, you know, everybody's kind of close together points-wise. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and in fact, Force and Boys will be playing in the next match. What can you tell me about that, Chalky? Well, we're going up against Nihilum. Uh, we're really looking, you know, we've lost two weeks in a row, and Nihilum's in first place, so we're looking to kind of dethrone them. Maybe we can move back into, like, second place territory. Top two is really where you want to be, so if, if we can get to three and two, we will be, if you ignore tiebreakers, we'd be in a, a multiple-way tie for first place, so... Right. It, it'd be a great position to be in at we, after week five. So it's pretty much kind of getting to that do or die point. I mean, there's three weeks left. This is a really huge week for us. It's a huge week for every team. Uh, this week's really going to define whether you're leading the pack or behind. And for a team like Celestial, it's a week where they have to start winning or else they're mathematically eliminated. They're out. Yeah, exactly. They can't possibly climb back in. So that's going to be a really big week for for them. We're, you know, the, the, the further along you go, uh, the more important the wins become. So, you know, before we go, we're going to start uh, your matches, Shaki. Uh, a quick shout out to Amazon App Store for sponsoring the event and Alpha Draft. If you guys want to check them out, um, you know, Esports Fantasy League. So if you want to check that out, alphadraft.com and amazon.com slash hearthstone for some you know, discounts on the card packs that you can get. Uh, Shocky again, thanks for casting. Yeah, I wish you luck a pleasure. Uh, in your games. Hope you do All that. right, man. We're going to take a short break right now, and when we get back, we're going to have Liquid Savits with us casting Nihilum versus Force and Boys. Check that out right after this.